Yes, go live. Woohoo! Da 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 dee dee da 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 dee. Bum bum bum. Mhm. Mm Hello. How are we all doing today? Da da. Hello. How is everyone? Let's see. Hello, John Shea. How are Albert Zasky? Hello, Carl von Gasberg. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Dylan Nalair. Hello, Bill Tripton. Hello, Carl von Gasberg again. Shane F. Jane Jack Hunter. Hello, Alistair Crow. Hello, DG40. Hello, Ian Carr. Hello, Alistair Crow. Milking the girders. Um. Yes and no. More clearing up um, some of the detritus from today because I've been working in my office for quite a large chunk of today, and you know, getting everything done and organised. Hello, Kahitran. Hello, Daniel Munro. Hello. Mm, I'm sorry, I finally got around to watching Greyhound. That wasn't too bad. I'm sure it's a realism, but it's an enjoyable enough film. <laughs> Um, I mainly go by the realism by Jamie because he has more of a stomach to watch these things than I do. Um, because I get that they're just worrying. I, he's told me it's good enough that I should watch it, and I will at some point watch it, but I haven't watched it yet. Um, mainly because it's just not been on something I've been able to access yet. Right then. Hello, Greg Stasky. Hello, Daniel Freeman. Hello, Paul from Chicago. Hello. Hello, Vida Bryce. Hello, Yankee Clipper. And hello, Tis Francis Fault. And Vodka8829. And Agnes Flo. And I think I've got said hello to everyone. Hello. How are we all doing? You were going for a nap. Tis Francis Fault. You were going for a nap instead of watching me. That's terrible. Dog's water bottle. I have a corgi and a standard poodle. They both like to drink water like it's going out of fashion. We get for about four of those in a day. Because, ah, also got second Astra. If I praise the uh, false flying boat, call the ambulance. Okay, Carl, we'll accept that. Hello, Tammy Luca. Hello, Flumland. How are you doing? And hello, New England. It's a Yankee Clipper. <sighs> Today is going to be an interesting topic. Today is really an interesting topic. And uh, it's kind of a continuation from the live me and Drac were involved in yesterday on World War II TV. If you haven't seen it, I do recommend you go and enjoy it. It's a, it was a very fun live. It, we're talking about the Italian Navy and how the Regia Marina is forgotten for their joys in World War II and what they get up to. We also spend a lot of time doing almost as much Rommel bashing as we do BT bashing. Let's be honest, we can, we're not going to resist that one. Um, I was like, oh, come on, Doc, it's Crow like the bird with an E for educated. Hmm, Alistair Crow. Hmm. <laughs> crow E. Um. Oh, you see, the trouble thing is, I'm Clark with an E on the end, and I'm always pronounce it. With, I don't pronounce uh, it with the E on the end. I just pronounce the E sound. Team look at okay. He didn't butcher my name as many Brits do. Team look at uh, team look at. Uh, well, um, I have a slight advantage in that I have a lot of Finnish students, so occasionally I do manage to do that okay. And one of my I would say one of my good friends, although we actually haven't speak or spoken in a few months, but she's doing her PhD in Chicago University at Chicago University in philosophy and AI. She's combined the two ethics and the future of AI and really, really smart. Um, you know, typical Viking looking young lady. Um, looks like she would definitely be able to carry a battle axe into battle and whack someone. While still summing, uh, somehow managing to dress like a model. We'll leave that to one side. But anyway, uh, 
yeah, that she has a very interesting Finnish name, and because she's half Finnish, half German, and I have to um, pronounce that. So that kind of taught oh, taught me a bit. Anyway, looks like Greyhound is uh, getting a Blu-ray release in July. Maybe then I'll finally be able to see it. What was hope? I'm waiting for it to be on, you know, virtuals. Great, Gary Matter, hello, how's the book doing? Am I able to order it now? Subject matter was about tribal, correct? Tribals, battle, and daring class destroyers. And it should be able to order now. It's supposed to be coming out in November, as I understand it. It's all being delayed because they are hoping to be able to do a book tour, because it's got enough sales, it's done quite well, it's doing well enough they're considering a book tour. So we'll hope it keeps, and in pre-order sales, keeps going up. Um, but I'm not sure if that's enough that I should be really happy or not, because you have to remember, and this is something for books which are academic books, and we'll get into this in a second, I'm just letting people catch up and join the, uh, the, join the views, because um, it's still going up. For every book sold, you get between 7 and 8% as the author in in terms of academic history books. And that's quite good for a first book. It's quite good for any book, actually, is what I'm getting. So uh, I, I did work it out that for... Basically, for me to get the value of two books, I have to sell 25. And that's if I'm the, the hard copy and I get the 8%. 7% it gets weirder and more difficult to work out. But basically, if I sell 25 books, I get the... I get... Theoretically, earn... Um, were two books. So if you work out whatever the price of the book is, I get roughly 8% of that if it's hardback, 7% if it's paperback. Which is why, again, I tend to not worry about people which other people are buying, because there isn't much that or difference between 7 and 8%. That's the correct. Are you, uh, correct. Are you doing signed copies of the book? Yeah. I might be going to. I'm going to be getting some sent to me, I hope. And I'm uh, hopefully, as I said, if the book tour does happen, I'll enjoy it. She, the philosophy in AI, she does not have to be called Susan Calvin, is she? No. Usually, she goes by her middle name, which is Anna. But uh, no, um, she's not Susan. She is very, very smart, though. Uh, just drop. Hello, Doctor. I really need to know how bad ship's logs are if current ship's logs are in the indication. Thank goodness for computers and edits. <laughs> um, you see this slight hunched back I have naturally, uh, this sort of slight indentation on my neck, this bad posture. Yeah, that's from ship's logs in the National Archives. That is literally doing this the whole time over them to try and figure out the writing. This is why I tend to lean back to try and overcorrect when I'm at home in other in more comfortable chairs, and I like really like the big screens. And the second big screen has arrived, and once I have the graphics card for the pro uh, the uh, the tower PC, that will be plugged in, and I will have be operating two giant, lovely, lovely screens, which have been sent to me very nice, well, very nice subscribers. Paul and, um, is he on here? I don't think he's on here at the moment. Might be on him. Um, which have, are wonderful. They are wonderful. They, they will help me it, it really sort of try and not get backache the whole time. <sighs> Although it's getting close. It is getting really close. You might be able to hear Taffer is currently woofing at my sister. Dunlele, finally got my hands on the Castle Class Corvette you showed a while back. Should be a good read. It will be a lovely read. And in fact, that book and several others like it have been what this is today's thing, today's um, discussion has been created thanks to. Honestly, without it, it wouldn't have been able to happen. And. So you can have Azure Lane on two monitors. Um... Uh. 
At the moment, what I'm doing is I have the chat on one monitor full screen, so I can read you all, hopefully coming through. And I have this screen repeating, or the smaller screen actually, uh, repeating the camera image, so I know roughly what I look like. Roughly. Emphasis on the roughly. Oh. Map. Oh. Oh. Hmm. I have a rough idea. <clears throat> oh, that's slightly better. And if I do that a tad more. Oh, that's a lot better. I can now sit the center of my desk. I must have knocked it earlier. I do apologize to everyone. <sighs> Bill Truett, most deck logs are 90% boring, 9% interesting, and 1% incredibly funny. True, but a fairly good chunk are very, very disturbing. Now, um, in today's topic, I have to credit two big sources. One of them is this book, Coastal Convoys, 1939-1945 by Nick Hewitt. Link to it down below in the description. Please use that link. It's the first direct link I've sort of used from Amazon, if you want to go and buy it. And apparently I get a penny every time someone clicks, someone buys it through there. So, you know, that's nice. The pennies add up. I'm being... Uh, if you think I'm being money-orientated today, I do apologise. Um, a paycheck is late. <sighs> and it's annoying me. So, you know, it's kind of on the brain today. So I apologize in advance. <clears throat> Gary Metrovic. I recently found a Warspike Facebook group. There's a man in Harrogate who's still alone was a sailor border in Model 2. Are these sailors being recognized? Probably not, but they should be. We'll try and work on something at some point, me and Drac. <laughs> you are going to enjoy today. The other source, uh, there is a link also down below, I've used quite a lot for the coast part of this, is Harry Bennett's PDF, which you can get for free. So the Harry Bennett one is free. Okay? The Coastal Convoys. Mm. Hello, Peter Nell. Uh, is the one from Amazon. People I'm not sure modern computers help. Several years ago, a chess friend of mine was telling me about the logs of several work machines, and one of them was apparently near Denmark. Yeah, <laughs> they can be interesting computers. Anyway, so, this is Patreon 23, as proposed by Paul from Chicago. And, firstly, let's start talking about the Royal Navy Commands, because I know I've talked about this before, but let's emphasize this. We have the Orkney and Shetlands, which technically has one sub-command area of Scarpa. The rest is all under the main command of Orkney and Shetlands directly. Then you have Rosyth, which has Cromatary, uh, Aberdeen, Rosyth, and Newcastle as its sub-areas. Then you have the Nor, Humber, Howitch, Nor, and Dover. Portsmouth is Portsmouth and Portland. The Western Approaches, Devonport, Falmouth, Cardiff, Milford, Liverpool, Belfast, Clyde. And technically also Rosyth, but I call it North Atlantic and often uh, in practice acting as its own area, Stonranway. Now, here's the thing. Coastal convoys would be passed between these areas. So a coastal convoy, which let's say it was going clockwise or anti-clockwise or was going to, if you're, they would come in, let's say, to one, the western approaches, they'd be guided into one of the main ports, the, the, the antic convoy, and then it would be split up into dozens of convoys. And there would be also coastal convoys which were made up of the coastal, tra uh, tra uh, coastal ships going around. Because 
You need it. It's a major part of the logistics system. If you consider the thousands upon thousands of lorries we now have in the UK today, the miles upon miles of roads, the miles upon miles of depots and storage, and all sorts of other things we have, to take the place of what used to be a very much a sea-based economy. Coordinating all these uh, these convoys was a colossal task. Now, some point in time, at this point, and um, I will go get it, I bring up the picture of the British command in the world. Now... <sighs> You will know this lovely picture because you'll have seen this picture about a bazillion times before. Because I have to show it off quite a lot. Because it is important. And because it matters. This is the thing. This is how complicated coastal command is and the, the home area commands. So yes, there's home fleet as well over all of this, which has the, the battle fleet and all that sort of thing. But if you consider it, there are three, five, functionally six, but technically five Royal Navy commands commanding home waters. In contrast, the rest of the world is divided up into two, four, six, eight, Ten. So, Britain has five commands for the UK and ten commands for the rest of the world. Think about that. In car. How much coal was needed for ships for the by the Iron World War Two, and were the Jellico special coal trains from South Wales to South of Scotland reduced? The Royal Navy by World War II was overwhelmingly oil-powered and oil-fired. There were still coal-burning ships. They hadn't got rid managed to get rid of all of them. But functionally, the, uh, the coal, coal, Jellico Special doesn't need to be quite reintroduced. There's still significant coal trains moving around, but there's still also significant ships moving coal around. This front of all, let's not forget the standard containers had yet to be used. Less efficient, more ships, and slower turnarounds. Well, we often do point about a say less efficient, but they work freaking hard. They're not that inefficient. Hello, Roland Cash. Would you say coastal traffic was as vital as domestic railways? I would say it's almost more, domain, more vital than the railways. Because here is the thing. The ships come into across the Atlantic, or they come across, or wherever they've come from around the Commonwealth. They've come up the coast of Africa and they've crossed, come across the Bay of Biscay or something like that. They get to Britain. You don't unload them in the first port they come to. It's rather the same again as we were discussing uh, last night on the World War Two TV. It's like the ports in Libya. Each port has its capacity. There's also the sensibility of where do you unload? You unload the ship in the port you can nearest to where the supplies are needed. So if you'd had all those ships come to Liverpool and try and unload in Liverpool, A, Liverpool docks would have been never getting through them all in time. There's just no, there's not the space, there's not the functional ability to do it. B, you'd have then had to move all that stuff around the country, mostly by railway, because there isn't the lorry infrastructure, there isn't the roads. And thirdly, honestly, you then have to reload it mostly on ships, because, again, there isn't the lorries and loads. So mostly, those ships come in, and then they go off. And it's kind of like... And I'll be getting this later, and some... Uh, 
some people, like, uh, authors, various historians come up with the idea that the coastal convoys are like a bus network. And I do agree with that. But I take that much further. Because let's consider it your journey home. And you require two forms of public transport for that journey. You get the high speed train, let's say from, let's say you work in London, to the nearest town to where you live. Then you get the bus from that town, uh, from that train station to the nearest bus stop to where you live. And then you walk the rest of the way. That is what we're talk that is the kind of network, the kind of connection we're talking about. We're talking about a scenario where yes, you come into here, but rather than you getting off loaded into a new thing, rather than the ship imagine the train is the Atlantic convoy. And then the coastal convoys are the bus routes. Because they just go around and stop at every place. The Atlanta, the train just whooshes straight express from America, uh, from the, uh, from probably actually Nova Scotia and Canada, uh, to the UK. That's what it does. Boom. Comes. All right. We, hey, we've arrived in Liverpool. Big escorts get to go. Yeah, we've brought all these ships across. Yeah, we can now turn around and do another escort route. Yay, we've got an escort carrying us. Woohoo, we've got destroyers. Yay, we've got all the, we've got flag class corvettes. Woohoo. Um, the merchant ships are going, where are you going? Where are you going? And the coastal convoy crew's going, hello, we're in trawlers. We're here to get you round the coast. Hello. And the convoy, convoy is sort of going, where, 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 where are you going? We know we made fun of you because you were, you know, we could never see you when you were fighting the submarines, but we want you back now. That's got it makes sense to move low value bulk cargo like coal by coastal vessel. A couple of small coastal traders can move the same amount as a large train and probably use less fuel. Pretty much. That's good. A coastal convoy is being like buses. You mean you wait ages and then free right once? That could end up happening, but mostly they tried very, very hard to make sure they didn't happen. Jeremy, inter introductory question. Were ports and canals infrastructure capacity a major obstacle? I found the same that after the war, UK had problems with intermodal use like GAR due to British canals uh, being older, Victorian era, and then quite narrow. They weren't so much an issue during World War II, but it's after World War II when the size of loads increase. And um, mainly the problem actually isn't the canals. <laughs> it's the infrastructure built around the canals. Because a lot of our canals go through quite built up areas. A lot of our canals have bridges built over them for railways. And people don't want to pay to upgrade them. They don't want the, the, the trouble of, well, if you're, you're going to have to stop the main line running for a couple of months while you rebuild the bridge. Hello, 64. Hello. Or rather, Ian. Hi, Alex. Ian Coombs. I uh, hi, Ian. You are, uh, I, I, pre you, are you using a, you're using a WISE account, aren't you? And uh, this is what I'm ge guessing, um, guessing or something. Hello. <sighs> Darius Ransky, or one is faster than expected and you wait for ages for the other one. That can happen as well. Convoy. Where where had the big ships on the coast? We're here. <laughs> uh, Dan Freeman, how, convoys, how, escorts. Have you seen the motor launches? Sometimes the escorts were motor launches, and um, so you know we'll be getting into those though as things go on. Here are some of the, to give you an idea, and I miss this started off with me looking at various lists and going, I'll nick this. And basically what happened was I found the list on Wikipedia, went and found out where the list came from and then nicked it shamelessly. Um, these are some of the convoy routes and these are just the coast, some of the coastal convoy routes and they're co-prefixes. There is BB Belfast River or uh, Belfast or River Clyde to Bristol Channel. BC BD BK BTC. All these uh, these convoys going on.
it is a sea of acronyms which are necessary, but this is what the world is like at this point. And the reason you have Liverpool to the Atlantic Ocean, i.e. OB, was because often you would have convoys for Ireland tag on to ocean-bound convoys, transatlantic convoys. Ronan Cash, Nick, this I think you mean quoting source material. Well, I I I, I would be quoting them if any if they, if they actually listed their names and didn't list their sources. But um, mostly this it comes from sections in this as well, which is it seems which are being put together, and it is pretty much the same as the list in here. And here is the good example. British and Allied merchant losses by theatre. After uh, from, this is Nick Hewitt's taking it from Roskill's War at Sea, which I was tempted to get down, but I had this quite enough on. In 1939, the British lost 455,000 tons, that's 165 ships, in coastal waters. Compared to 249,195 tons or 47 ships in the North Atlantic. And in fact, only in 1941 and 1942, ooh, basically up until 1941, the British lose more ships in coastal waters than they do in the North Atlantic. The British run 3,584 convoys for the coastal operations. They have a total ships take part in those convoys of 104,792. They lose in those principal coastal convoys, and this is principal coastal convoys. Just the principal coastal convoys, not the rest of them they lose 178 ships across the seven years of war. That's 1939 to 1945. The coastal convoys have slipped through the net of history, yet they were absolutely vital to the survival of nations and later to the invasion of Europe. But just one thing, the London River power stations were all fueled by Welsh coal, uh, coal, which had to be brought round daily, without interruption. And the Mulberry Harbour and great flocks of landing craft for D-Day didn't just spring up in the Solent. We brought them there. That's the quote from Jack Yeatman of the Royal Naval Patrol Service trawler, Pearl, at the end of this book. This runs on. My, first, uh, my daughter has changed my username. <laughs> Say hi to your daughter for me. I hope she's well. This runs on. There's no point filling just one port. It's better at times to ship to the outer, other side of the country and get an empty return train back to an overloaded port. Logistics can be counterintuitive. Yeah, it's true. Hello, my 1640. <sighs> In car, were coastal traffic flows significantly changed from east to west coast by mines and interference by Germany? The Germans would have liked them to be significantly interfered with. They were significantly affected, but they still had to be run. There was no other options, so you ran them and you did the mine sweeping operations. Looking sharp tonight, by the way. Thank you. 
Hello, Delta Pivio. Uh, Delta Pivio. Right, gone from my phone to 24-inch screen. I still can't read that clearly, but they're at least identified as letters and numbers. I know, it is... Uh, there are so many. It was a case of, do I divide this between multiple... You know, slides, or do I just put this on one slide for you? And honestly, it's... You will... You will be really enjoyed by looking into this. It's really quite cool. If you're interested in organizational theory of navies and the various things they get up to, this is really cool stuff. Um, Rowan Cash, are the losses of ships due to the nature of slow ships? Not always. It's more due to the fact that, and we'll be getting to this, the coastal convoys could have everything thrown at them the whole way through the war. And it's it, we, we always think, when we're talking about World War II, you think about the submarine wolf packs hunting in the middle of the Atlantic. That's immediately, you know, the cruel sea and all these movies build up, and that's the image in your head. And then you realise... Hang on, those same packs would occasionally be hunting in, well, the smaller U-boats would occasionally be hunting in similar packs off the coast of the UK, and they'd also lay mines, and they could be backed up by Stukas and other aircraft of the Luftwaffe, and they could also have Schnellboots taking part, and gets painful and the average speed for a coastal convoy uh, it's, it seems to be they go as fast as the slowest ship available no one seems to have worked out what the average ship uh, speed was because there's the theoretical average speed but that's presuming all the ships are at their peak of maintenance and therefore able to do, can maintain their top speed for the entire time quite a lot of them weren't That's good. If the US were engaging in a bit of signal intercepts, they'd be alarmed by the number of BBs the British Royal Navy were talking about, and then never mention again shortly after. Well, honestly, they'd have been wondering, they'd have heard a lot of BBs, a lot of BCs. They'd have probably been wondering what the fricking in the name of all things holy were BDs and BKs. And I would add that in Hewitt's book, but this is the only place I could find this, he also mentions BEs and there is also a BTC there. So, you know, what if if you're the Americans, what do you think that that's, you know, battleships, battle cruisers, battle destroyers, the BDs, uh BKs, Burger Kings, um BEs, battle escorts, you know, what are they? BTCs? Battle total combustions? Y you know, it, it, it could get quite worrying for the uh, for the Americans doing intercepts. Hello, Tom Golding. Darius Rosigan, this is Drax Western Approaches video all over again, Coastal Edition. It is, but unlike... Uh, he, I don't have the cool background of doing the Western Approaches Museum. I would love to do that, uh, done, done that but I haven't got one. Darius Rosigan, five knots on a good day. Strub. Also, did they separate high-speed ships and extra ships? No. But we're getting into this. Hello, Yikas. Tom Golden. Good evening, that's fine. Apologies for being late and missing the last few. Oh, don't worry. Hello. Anyway, regarding oil in Model 2, I heard the Belper produced only uh, are only onshore oil, and all that went to, to an ICI plant near Liverpool for titration to 150 grade avgas. Um, we had plenty of oil. That's one of the strange things the British had because legacy of World War One and pre World War One, we had been stockpiling oil for a long time. We had a lot of fuel stored, a lot of fuel stored. It's one of the reasons why the British have the plan to basically oil the beaches if the Germans invaded with Operation Sea Lion. 
and their entire plan hinged largely on some very brave World War I um, survivors who had re-enlisted and whose jobs were, broadly speaking, to sit on the top of cliffs in sheltered concrete positions, watching until the Germans were well and truly on the beach. Then they would open the valves, let the oil come bubbling up to the surface, and then press the igniter and incinerate them. That is how much fuel the British had available. They could contemplate that. Because remember, that's not just general fuel. That's fuel sitting in tanks waiting for that to happen. So that's fuel you're able to take out of circulation from your day-to-day -day running of your fleet to secure your beaches. Pete Dawson, why is Greyback's outward direction from Dieppe to New, ha uh, to New Haven? Surely in 43, it's New Haven to Dieppe and returns that way. They have many, many random names for things. This is random. Colliers were never the faster boats. No, they weren't. That's good. That and a BF-109 could load a 250kg bomb fairly early. Which would easily do crippling damage to a coastal steamer. It would do a lot of damage to a coastal steamer. Rowan Cash, did the attacks ever come up the Bristol Channel towards the uh, Dirt Squad's stomping ground? There must have been a lot of traffic from Mephir Tyrrell, Newport, and Cardiff. Yes, they did. Dirt Squad, KP was a USN designation for coastal patrol ship. Therefore, BK is a coastal patrol craft with 14 inch guns. Potentially, you know, Vickers could have had a really good day. As I think I was talking about in a Dreadnought video, which I, hasn't gone live yet, but is part of the series to go live, it came very close to HMS Dreadnought herself being fitted with 14 inch guns. So, you know. Uh, Timo Locker, what if Scotland and Nish go as independent? How does the RN look then? Uh, we have to move a lot of submarine bases uh, and a lot of submarine, uh, submarine in the south very quick. Uh, and probably we're going to start constructing, we'd have to move construction of ships south. So basically, Camelairs, um, Portsmouth, and Devonport would suddenly, probably Southampton as well, would probably suddenly have a lot of orders placed in them. Belfast might also get some orders for Harland Wolf, although that'd be kind of interesting because they, I think they currently have houses built between them and the water. Very sassy. Germany, we have to convert trucks to run on coal, gas, and wood, and run over Roma uh, rake over Romanian oil fields. UK, we have so much oil, we can pour it over the beaches. Yes! <sighs> that was a system the British had in use at an airfield, perhaps a few, where they would pump oil into trenches up and down the airfield and burn it to clear the fog. Yep. Fido. The anti-fog experiments, I think. Yeah, there are lots of various fun things British do with oil. Um... <laughs> anyway, let's go on to this. Here's some stats for you. So, I have a quote from Harry Bennett's one, which is why I have a link to it down in the description. Whatever way they are measured, losses in UK coastal waters were considerable. The Collier Company, Everett's, lost 16 vessels on the East Coast during the war. France, a Fenwick and Tyneside-based company, and uh, France, Fenwick, a Tyneside-based company, lost nine ships in UK coastal waters. Nick Hewitt has estimated that 1,431 merchant ships were lost in coastal waters during the Second World War, totaling 3,768,599 tons. Human casualties amounted to something like 3,600 dead amongst the merchant seamen of perhaps 20 nations. As J.P. Foynes has put it, not a battle of the Atlantic, but a severe campaign by any other standards. Similar sentiments were expressed during the war by the Royal Navy officers tasked with defending the convoys. Towards the end of 1942, C&C Nor estimated that between the start of the war and 14th of November, 63,350 transits of the East Coast Passage had been made by merchant ships. 
A total of 157 merchant ships had been lost as a result of enemy action, 0.24% of the total number of sailings. He expressed some satisfaction with the figure. These losses cannot, in my opinion, be regarded as excessive and comparably favourably with other convoys sailing through dangerous waters. Despite these successes, the Royal Navy remained anything but complacent. In October 1943, at the start of the Winter Convoy Battles, and influenced by the inadequate number of escorts at his disposal, CNC Nor wrote to the Lordship of the Admiralty to demand further resources. He commented, I consider the extraordinarily small losses which have taken place over recent months must be attributed principally to good fortune and lack of enterprise on the part of the enemy. He warned, these two factors cannot be expected to continue. Definitely. Okay. So. Please don't take this the wrong way, but I appear to have missed a couple of zeros off my... Um, my list of convoys, so hey ho uh, but that is supposed to be yeah a lot more than 450 convoys. Um, <clears throat> a lot more. There were something like, I think it is supposed to be 45,000 convoys were run during the war. I see uh, from my notes that's what it seemed to be, but again, I've lost zeros there and I've now not trusting the note as zeros on my notes uh, during, during the war. The vast majority were coastal convoys, rather than it being the next the case of Mersey Bar being home safe. It was not the end of the journey, as I've already said. Uh, the system is used by some historians as operating like a bus service. And so, here's the example. Um, a ship bound from Halifax, Nova Scotia to Hull, with hell in between, would be brought into Liverpool by an Atlantic convoy. Next day, the Irish Sea Coastal would take her down to Milford Haven. We would take her on to Cowes Roads in the Wales, uh, uh, Wales, uh, Wales Portsmouth. The Channel Lease would then deliver her to the Thames Estuary, and the East Coast take her up through E-Boat Alley to the Umber, and in reverse on the outward journey. So, in simple terms... She, a ship would come in and then take part in one, two, three, four coastal convoys, and then do another four convoys back. Hi, Carl Harmon. Ron Cash, I'm guessing coastal ships did not get much in the way of AA bandings. They did get a bit, but again, there were rules about what, what could be mounted and where and, you know, all sorts of things. <sighs> Derek Trowski, so now start coming to coastal seabed for coal deposits? You'll find a lot. The convoys could face U-boats in the Irish Sea, often off coast and in the West Channel. Schnell boats, or E-boats, and aircraft all along the south coast and up around East Anglia. You'd also tend to have aircraft attacking forces in Austra in Scotland, uh, you, especially coming across from Norway, would be attacking convoys around the north coast. You would occasionally have some of the more interesting longer-range attacks uh, hit in the Bristol Channel and hit in the, off the south coast of Wales, so they could have fun. Minefields could be deployed everywhere, sometimes deployed by aircraft, sometimes deployed by submarines, sometimes deployed by British ships, and but not marked down properly. And then you also have the Atlantic gales between Milford Haven and Land's End, and fog in the channel, just to add to your fun. Oh, and heavy guns covering the Straits of Dover, and yes, we tried to, we ran convoys through the Straits of Dover. On a fairly regular basis. Sean Mac, how often were rules stretch are ignored on a, re a fairly regular basis? On top of this, unlike the ocean convoys where ships were grouped with those of similar size, speed, and turning circle, 
The coastals contained the lot. Liners converted to troop ships. Liberty ships, tankers, flat iron colliers, small coasters, and tiny, usually Dutch, scoots. All of with different turning circles. Handling characteristics, especially in heavy weather. And from 1943 onwards, flights of basically unseaworthy landing craft and tugs towing the huge, unwieldy concrete Cassians which would form the Mulberry Harbour. Getting such a collection through the three turns necessary to round land's end in Atlantic Gale, sorted out after having to anchor because of fog, or to reverse course when warmed the V-boats off the Lizard or Start Point, could be quite a problem. Now, Here's the theoretical thing. Escort group for one of these convoys should have been four Aztec trawlers and one of the little Hunt class destroyers, or an old VW which had been converted for coastal destroyer work. But often they would be a couple of trawlers, sometimes only one trawler. The destroyers included ones which had lent to our, which we had lent to our various allies, and having to read spelled out Polish names such as Blitankia, Karakia, Kuech, and it could be a problem for the telegraphist. Although those destroyers would tend to be some of the bigger and more capable fleet destroyer level forces, so actually they were quite like to have along, although they did have fun trying to work out their names. You have other fun in that to not reveal their positions, all the merchant ships would have their radios sealed. So they would have their radios completely sealed, they wouldn't be able to use them, the only ships with working radios in the convoys would be the escorts, and if they're a trawler with their radio they're going all sorts of oh, la, 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 and they might not get the message it's how do i describe it it's complicated because everything you think about convoys you know comes from the battle atlantic or the arctic it comes from those convoys most likely unless you do have actually read the subject beforehand in which case you know better but if most people who've only read the common books on convoys, etc. We'll talk about Atlantic, and we'll talk about the Arctic. And you'll see these huge escort fro fro forces, and distant cruisers, and oh, they're an escort carrier, and a brave destroyer commander, of a half a flotilla of fleet destroyers, ready to do battle with German heavy cruisers and drive them away. You know, that sort of thing. Then there's the coastal convoys. There are lots of them, and lots of them running at the same time, and we just haven't got enough resources to do that. So they get this sort of thing. Roland Cash, word loss is considered acceptable as you can replace some of the coastal ships. Ah, uh, they prefer not to lose any, lose any if they could avoid it, but they, you know, lost them. <laughs> Ron Cash, who on earth was in command of these pocket convoys as they were in transit? Oh, that that leads me to this particular joy, and this is a quote again from this book, but it's just it's just a good one. They usually put they always have a convoy commodore. And you have variable relations between them and their, some of their convoys. Some Commodores are well respected, some aren't. Most of them are retired Royal Navy officers. Some of them are very senior ranks, and I have a theory over pretty much which one this is, but they do not name them. There is a very, there is a <clears throat> retired Rear Admiral who would uh, have matched this description. But anyway, one red-bearded, piratical-looking Commodore drafted signals like business letters. Once, when an escort ventured to suggest that he was off course, he made a polite reply beginning, My dear sir, I would have you know that there are on this bridge at present no less than four master mariners. In other words, are you quite sure I'm off course or you are, considering I have four people on this bridge who have about... 160 to 240 years of um, navigation experience between them, 
Do you want to shut up now and go away, or do you want to continue to try and pretend you know navigation better than we do? On another occasion, when asked for his ETA, that's the estimated time of arrival, the same Commodore started the senior officer escort, who might have been a trawler captain, might have been a corvette captain, you never know, might have been a destroyer captain on that day. Um, I hope that we shall not be late. My sweetheart's waiting at the gate. According to my ETA, we reached the boom at noon today. <laughs> I just... They're, they're characters. Uh, they are fun, though. Sometimes less than others. And each Commodore, you know... The convoy Commodore would be carried in one of the merchant ships. That would be set up as a flagship. And their theoretical jobs try and ensure that the skippers maintain the right speed and course and obey convoy instructions. Um, some of them were actually experienced merchant skippers rather than retired Royal Navy officers. Um... Most of the, even the retired, mer the senior experienced merchant skippers would usually have been R&R, that's Royal Navy Reserve Officers. And... On, whilst on the longer oceanic convoy routes, they were usually very much um, former senior admirals of a very advanced age, uh, who, were, who could be just usually categorised as um, formidable. Uh, the, but basically, gentlemen who had retired, but really much wanted the help, and wanted to be of service to their country, and were taking a drop in rank to Commodore in order to do their bit. However, coastal commander convoys usually had to make do with an R&R &R commander or lieutenant commander. Occasionally did have a few captains, and as I said, I have a strong suspicion who that particular red-bearded one is, because he does coastal convoys and oceanic convoys, if it's the one I'm thinking of. He likes to do both. And, um, yes, he was a very re a retired rear admiral with a big bushy red beard, and definitely described as looking like a pirate on various other cases. Um, invariably over 60 years of age and ineligible for return to frontline duty, so they were put on convoy commodores. It's just, yeah, it's fun. And you find things like the Dems are run by um, Sir Admiral Sir Frederick Dreher. And the Dems are, of course, the defensively equipped merchant ships a section, i.e. the people who man guns on the merchant ships. All sorts of different things going on to try and keep these coastal convoys running. Doesn't matter. FS series alone ran into a thousand. Well, you see, some of the convoys are very short. They last a day. You know, the route is less than a day, so they can that convoy boom done day, and there could be three or four sh convoys running that route that day. You can get you can build up numbers quite quickly. Run cash. Wow, well, Commodore, that is a high rank. Ah, uh, yes, they were given the rank of Commodore for the operations, and they were scared. Uh, Grace, I was, let's clock. who is this? I, I need to know. I, 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 we need to know. I will do some research, and if it's confirmed who it is, 
I will do a profile of them because they are one of the cool characters in World War Two. They are a cool character in World War One. They are one of the few Royal Navy officers who do the full Master Mariner route. Retires as a Rear Admiral in a mid nineteen thirties, and then returns in World War Two and likes to what. Uh, 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 from memory, he was widowed, but had three daughters, and he would be meeting and met by a different daughter each time he came back. And it got it, it basically he got the reputation that he was he, he just had a whole lot he had, you know, all sorts of younger girlfriends. Um, I, I, and I don't think he ever this abused the sailors of this notion because it stopped them trying to you know hit on his daughters. <laughs> I have a feeling who it is, but I'll need to do some checking to be sure, because I don't want to say who I think it is, and then it's completely wrong. Yeah, that'd be cruel. Ron Cash, what was the highest traffic route? The highest traffic route... They're all fairly high. East coast, south coast is pretty high. Uh, coming down the west coast, along the south coast to London is possibly the highest. But the East Coast is also shot. It's a basically constant two-way roundabout. Trollers sound funny. Till you know they had three DC racks, hedgehog, or squid launchers, and a, sh a load of light caliber weapons. They are? We'll get into them. Uh, Darius Rowski, destroy and escort commanders are all caretakers and loons. Comes with the territory. DDs are hellhounds of the sea. Mm. Alice Crow, well, was there Crow? Was there a land, regular land-based air cover or on call basis? There was supposed to be on. Uh, there was supposed to be air cover above each convoy as they went. In practice, there wasn't until later in the war when you had bow fighters, etc., in available in far large numbers that could basically stay up for the had the endurance out there. You have to remember the Hurricane and Spitfire are interceptors in their fuel support, and especially early in the war in terms of their fuel and range. They're interceptors. They are not long-endurance fighters. And that's another thing which affects aircraft design. If you consider which of the service which have been you know, building aircraft for endurance, fleet air arm, uh, you know, that's the interwar period. And there's a different reason for their difference in aircraft because they're designing them for range versus the Spitfire and Hurricane, which are designed for speed and maneuverability. Simon, what was used out of Milford Haven, and how long were they sailing? Uh, 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 were they sailing? Also, how busy must have known as a local? They were very busy, and <laughs> basically everything. If it's a port which is viable, they were using it. Ian Carr, is there still a UK national stockpile of four-inch naval guns for next time they are needed? We have a lot of storage facilities still left. Which no one's quite sure what's in any of them. So, you know. Ryan Cash, would international convoys be diverted to make better route for the coastal boys distributing their wares or once offloaded? No. International convoys were brought into certain big ports which had the things to defend those convoys coming in. And they would go into the one which was closest to their route. So if you're coming from that direction, boom. And then the ships just get tacked onto the convoys and taken around to the port that's close to them. So that might end up with them doing a full, almost a full circuit of the UK on their way in and way out. Thomas Lano, Ryan Cash, the Boofighter got the only in-action kill of a Type 21 U-boat. Hmm. Alistair Crow, you re can really uh, spot the long-range design on the Catalina. 
Awfully huge wingspan compared to the fuselage. Mm hmm. Well, so maybe some 14 or 15 inch guns too that no one has kept track of? Considering I'm half expecting us to find a, full, a fully working squadron of swordfish somewhere in one of these uh, things, one like it, it's, you know, I, I won't say which air station, but I might have been wandering around a Royal Naval Air Station a few years ago and pointed to some of the hangars um, that are storage hangars and still kept up on the outside, and that some they they have some sort of subterranean hangars around them as well in sort of spare airfields around them. Diversionary airfields, and um, I went. Eh, how often do you check those? Oh, we check them regularly. How often do you go inside them and check what's in them? Oh, we don't, we're not allowed to do that. Huh? Well, it's all secure, so we uh, we you know we go in and check that uh, we check it's all secure, and then we don't go don't go in. When was the last time anyone went in them? Um, we haven't needed to. So. Maybe that's changed. I That was about five, six years ago I did that, so maybe by now they've actually gone in them and have a look around them, or maybe the person who was telling me just didn't know, but they were the stores officer for that base, so you'd fear, I think they, and if anyone knew, they would. It was a fun time, let's say, and there are lots of facilities around the UK which could have lots of interesting things in, still. Well, best security against the spy pre-war is no one knowing what's there. That is true. Come on. In Kattegat, convoy of Vobelsudl, uh, a convoy full of um, seven, Type 7s and uh, Type 21. Later, could not crash dive so fast. Hmm. Be awesome. Tiger Moss uh, did ASW Escort in 1939, 1940 without a radio. Yep. Emergency salvage. In case of emergency, break glass. <laughs> hmm. That's the crap. No use of liberators or other long-range heavies for maritime patrol at the time. Not in 1939-1940. They came in later. You know, those things come in a lot later. The thing is, what do you have available in 1939-1940 is very different to what you have available later on. In 1940, some of the escorts are swordfish. Because they have endurance and they can sit up there above the convoys. And they have fun. Man of Tiffany, squadron of swordfish. So bolts of fabric and bobbles of string and some wood. Hmm, possibly. Maybe a blackburn, blackburn. Council of no one. Uh, you wouldn't have kept one of those, you hope. That would be scary if there was a Blackburn Blackburn, let's be honest. If there was a Blackburn Blackburn, and we're considering what what my subscribers are like over the Blackburn Blackburn, I would expect if we ever found one, it would be circled with, I don't know, candles and incense, and probably Carl von Gasberg would be in front of it prostrating themselves, going, All hail, or something. Dan Freeman, HF Queen of 21, uh, 2021 Air Group uh, of one F uh, RF Squadron F 35s, one USMC Squadron F 35s, Merlins, and where the did those swordfish come from? <laughs> uh, honestly, uh, when you listen to the next week's build pumps, you will hear us talking about swordfish. And gosh, off message, but my wife wants to know what your favourite quality street chocolate is. You can take a horse to water. Um, quality streets. Usually the green triangles, or the little, or, uh, the little sort of round ones that have caramel in, but they've changed the colour recently. Gross, that sounds like the correct ritual. That worries me. Um, <laughs> no candles. Come on, you cannot set up holy LED tea lights only. Okay, okay. Oh, you can remember. Oh, so routing. Well, routing's kind of interesting. Minefields were laid by both British and Germans, and sometimes you knew where both were. Sometimes you didn't know where either was. The aim was to chart through water deep enough to allow for high speed, wide enough to allow to manoeuvre, and yet shallow enough to liberate, uh, limit submarine attacks. And they had to be coordinated with a Royal Navy escort groups, 
local defence flotillas of Royal Navy ships, army shore batteries, the Royal Observer Corps, so they wouldn't report that there were enemy ships coming to invade, because that happened a few times, and the Royal Air Force. So I've got a quote here from Anthony First, East Coast um, War Channels. And the East of the W's in World War, the Second World War started off from where the First World War had left off, almost 21 years before. War channels themselves were reinstated, marked and swept. A mine barrage was laid across the Dover Strait starting 11 September 1939. Relatively small fields of deep and shallow mines were initially put in place on the East Coast. Then a massive East Coast mine barrier was established from December 1939 onwards. Convoys were introduced from the 6th of September. The principal ones on the east coast being the FN for a fourth north, i.e. northwards from south end to Mephil, and FS for south, uh, southwards from Mephil to south end series. Convoys of ocean-going vessels bound for the Atlantic also left the, from south end through the Straits of Dover westward through the channel as the OA, outbound, route A series, accompanied by coasters who tagged along whilst bound for channel ports. Although convoys were established from the start, it should be borne in mind that many ships continued to sail independently and were at much higher risk as a result. This is the part of the joy of life in that, yes, you can lead a horse to water, as was said earlier, but you cannot necessarily make it drink. In this case, you can offer convoys, but there are still some merchant sailors who think, ah, I can do better about that one. Night Hand Productions, I do wonder what kind of effect half a dozen RN Bogue type-ish carriers with swordfish would have had in early types of years in the Battle of the Atlantic against U-boats. Uh, I can answer that one. They would have had a massive long-term effect because they have probably increased the attrition rate of U-boats in the early war, which would have got rid of a lot of the pre-war trained and experienced um, Kriegsmarine uh, crews, and that would have had a knock-on for the entire war. Basically, anything you can do which kills the pre-war trained personnel of Germany quicker at the beginning of the war locks on with consequential impacts on the quality of their forces post-war. And it gets you more ships through. Don't find them. Oh no, minefields. Gets gaming PTSD attack. Cost me half my boats in Silent Hunter so far. So minefields are a nightmare. Fun though. <laughs> Dyer's asking, IKEA Swordfish, follow instructions and presto, Blackburn, Blackburn? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Frank's birth other. Um, well, that's the other thing. If you've seen the pictures recently of. And um, I will put them up. I'll put it up, actually. Um. We were wondering and I will put it up. This is the current picture which was released of HMS Queen Elizabeth at the moment. And um basically we decided it's so full of stuff that those could well be flat pack swordfish. That they're just not missing their carrying, because that's a lot of boxes to be packing into your hangar. That is a lot of boxes. Admittedly, they are carrying a Royal, uh, an F-35 squadrons for the first time on a full long-range deployment, so probably they have packed every store known to mankind they can possibly take along with them. But it's still a very chocker-full hangar. And that is how we started most of the day's bilge pumps. You know, on the hill, to the, the US DSR convoys with the, uh, the convoy, IGN turning a blind eye? Uh, it wasn't so much the IGN were turning a blind eye, it's that there were problems with them to try and intercept them. Nighttime Productions, hello! How is it? No elf? Like, uh, I'm worried now. Ryan Cash, water deep enough for high speed? I have seen Miami Vice and Baywatch. You don't need deep water, just a good haircut. 
Uh, no, but high speed relative in a um, a, a heavily laden um, <laughs> collier is a different requirement. <laughs> we go, coastal ships, they're all shallow draft. Yeah, they are until they're loaded to the max and then they're trying to go at high speed. <laughs> they don't tend to bulge up in the water. <laughs> Oh, Shy, wait, it, it was the merchant sailors who went... Um, the internet said the UK was stupid. Yeah. No, there were... And basically it was them going, well, hang on. The Germans aren't doing anything at the moment. We don't need convoy protection. There's no one attacking us. We can make it without them. And then we can run ourselves nicely and we can make our deadlines. Team Unlocker. Should Royal Navy build more unicorn siblings during the World War Two? Uh, during World War Two, they do. They're called the Light Fleet Carriers. If you want fun, take the drawing of the plan. Pardon me for HMS Unicorn and overlay it on the plan of the Colossus class or the Majestics, and just look at them and just go, oh. Copy and paste went worked well, didn't it? Yes, it did. Really well. Yes, it did. Slight modifications, but broadly speaking, copy and paste. I was asking, spare parts? Are needs an extra unicorn too? Again, we ended up discussing that. Sheriff's rolls and canvas rolls, wire rolls, steel tubes. Yep, swordfish. Mm. Can you imagine how many there are in the supply ships? I imagine they're completely full. Come, can you make the pre bilge pops recording a Discord event occasionally? It Honestly, we don't want to scare people. <laughs> the pre-Discord, the, the, the pre-actually us pressing the record button is often quite a scary conversation. It's hard to, it's hard to see it so full. It's supposed to originally hold 72 aircraft. It's hard to see it for, what, 23? It's actually got 10 in that picture. It's designed to hold roughly 24. I think it can take 24 F-35s. The maximum air group is supposed to be around about 40-something mm, with air deck parking. But it's the size of the aircraft and the size of the hangar. This is one of the reasons why I wanted the Queen Elizabeth class to be longer. Anyway, I could only... To talk about the losses, and this is the thing you have to talk about when you're talking about the convoys, I could only find this picture as a bit of an indicator, and it basically shows you, you can tell where the convoys went and what the convoy routes were by the wrecks. That is the east coast of the UK, and you can tell where the convoys gathered, you can tell where their routes were by where there are sunken ships. Mm. In car, hang boxes from the ceiling as the USN would do. Um, they've got them all sorts of packed around. And you have to remember also, if you look in this picture, if we go back to that picture, you can see that the hangar has been restricted because they brought in all the gantries at the sides up and various other things to uh, increase and maximize storage space. You can fold away those gantries on the side you can put uh, take them away and max and increase the space for more aircraft so you it, it, how do i put it at the moment it's a hangar which is around storage a lot of things uh, storing a lot of things but honestly here's the problem 
if you get rid of that storage space and using that storage space in the hangar, that stores those stores need still need to be covered. And if you're taking even more aircraft, then you're talking about going to need even more stores, which means you need a freaking big store a, a, a store ship. But you know, this is again meets links neatly back into the convoys. The convoys are are about getting stores around the UK. Wow, isn't it great that the forward aviation support ships turned into a good carrier? What a crazy absence and no way planned. Yeah. There is Razzie. For the QE carriers to be longer, you need a new dry dock. Well, we could use the one in Southampton, and that's a bit longer. But we honestly, frankly, I would have liked them to be longer, and I would have quite happily seen the money spent to make a longer dry dock. And a couple of longer dry docks because I think it would be useful. I think about 40 meters longer would have made me happy. And Cash, you can tell where the combos were by looking at where the wrecks are. Sounds a lot like stag parties. Yeah. Come to do you think they set up some hydrophonic phones or something? They set up a lot of, um, they did have as much of an anti-submarine warfare present as they could. Tell us, re reckon close to the comments, how much were just operational losses? I, you were, hang um, operational losses. Um, well, you can see some of them where there's big clusters are probably ports where they are either marshalling or organising for the convoys. But, um, you can still make out the routes. Riku cam. Some of the crates look suspiciously 19th century. -ish. Yes. Brown cash, we'd hope those mun those crates aren't munitions. Oh, and when they aren't building an iron ship, they could build merchants. Eh. As I said, it would be good to have longer carriers, but we'll leave that to one side. Hmm. Wow, it's already been 90 minutes and we haven't even got into part two. I will hurry through part two because I've done most of it before. Now, um, first things first, thank you to everyone who's watching. Thank you everyone who likes the videos. Thank you to everyone who subscribes and who presses the little bell down there to get alert when it's lives. Thank you very much for that. Thank you to everyone who's on Discord and chats away. Thank you to everyone who's a patron. Really is important, actually. I have to admit, this month it's been incredibly important because, as I said, um, a paycheck was forgotten to be processed by um, a to-be-unnamed university. Not Kingston. If anyone thinks that, that's no major university. They found, they they processed it fine, but another university um didn't process the bait check. So that was fun. That's been eight hundred pounds, and it's going to be 
at the end of the month, it's going to come through. But that means this month I was eight hundred pounds less than I expected to have in a month where car insurance and road tax come through and all those sort of things. So it was um, it's a, been a fun time. Thankfully. Thanks to Patron, those things could be paid. But uh, that was it. Literally, if it hadn't been for Patron, the money wouldn't have been there. So thank you very much to Patrons. Uh, the money, the when the money comes in, I will spend the commensurate amount on research. But um, thank you. Turns out Patron is, as I've been suspecting for a while now, more reliable in terms of being able to predict and guarantee the money will actually come into my account than. Uh, working for universities. Um, Inca, is your chart of wrecks of all time, or someone just World War Two, uh, just World War Two related, just World War Two related? That one was. Alice a crow. I'm looking at Do you like fruitcake? Um, depends on the fruitcake. Usually, yes, but sometimes if it's very spicy, no. Bud guy eight eight two nine. Now take it there is no dry deck in the UK to take a US supercomputer carrier. Uh yes, there is. I think it's Southampton. Um Mm -hmm. They have a, I think a few. I think uh, I seem to remember there is a dock in Southampton which is capable of handling large ships. The King George V dock is still there, and I think that's capable of handling quite large ships, but I, I think it's now a listed site and is not theoretically used. It would have had to be recommissioned. Yeah. The pay gates have been removed, but it's Considered of historic importance, and it was capable. Of, it is capable of taking ships up to 100, 100,000 tons. Um, it was inaugurated in July nineteen thirty three. So yeah, the shot of the stock is three hundred sixty six meters long, forty one meters wide, and fifty meters deep. The floor of the dock is 28 metres thick at the centre, tapering to 5 metres thick at the sides. Yeah, and it's still there. It just it's no longer used, but it could have been reused. It's still the pumping house, etc., and things are still there. Thank you, Alice Crow. Got to help starving historians. Not quite starving, as I said. It thanks to patron, not starving, but it was um, annoying. I think there might actually be another dock in Southampton as well. As well as that one. Um, as well as the King George V.
But Southampton has some pretty large facilities down there. Damn it. Mm. Doctor, uh, there's only six people. Doctor, are you using money specifically given to you for Iron Brew? No, oh, stop. How could you? Actually, no. The money specifically for Iron Brew is the very nice and very generous super chats, which Alistair Crow and Tima Luka, uh, Tima Luka uh, Locker have provided. That's always specifically for Iron Brew. The rest is fear is used to cover research costs as a whole. But as I said this month, because that got paid to me early in the month when the bills came in, it had to cover the bills because the paycheck didn't come in and the paycheck's been a delayed by a month. It happens. And so now I'm going to use the money from the paycheck to replace that and use that to fund research. It's what you have to do sometimes, but it shouldn't happen because I do the work and I put in the hours. I'm so starving, I can't even afford a patron. Talk about pathetic. <laughs> I, uh, I know. I understand that. I used to be that at one point during my PhD. It was fun. Wonder how long it would take to get new gates for it. Well, the thing was, if you would... It, it, this is the thing. When they were looking and considering the Queen Elizabeth class, if they'd gone with the large design option... Part of the options were what would work, which ones would we do? And we'd either have to lengthen the dock up in Scotland and put or put new gates on the uh, one in Southampton. And they were actually decided they were going to do both if they went with longer designs. So it would have been good. Bad guy. So the King George V dry dock would have a hard time taking a lesson in its class and four class carriers since they're over 100,000 tons. I think it could be modified quite easy to take them. Thank you, Roland Cash. It is fine. I always assumed it was harbour depth being more an issue, though I guess some dredging would sort that out. Mm, yeah. Gosdras, how are you doing my research when everything is closed? Actually, the National Archives is open, and I managed to go there the other day, and mainly by buying books. That's what I'm having to do for my research. I'm having to do a lot of book-based research, and uh, occasionally getting um, files, paying for files which have already been digitalized, and paying for uh, copies of them to be sent to me from the lovely arch various archives. Greetings, Animal 16365. Thank you, Night Home Production. Um, Samsung, I mean, they, the government, is spending my money, decides how much I spend. Guess what? They expect to get paid for the service, too? Um. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, so, here are some of the ships that the British and various services were using. And this comes from one of my other previous presentations which i did on small ships so if you want to go and look for more details about these ships please do it was a great presentation and again there should be a link to it down below he says there should be a link to it down below There should be a link for it. Um, let me see. Yeah, basically it's... Um this uh, 
as it hasn't. Uh, uh, I just realised it wasn't down below. There you go. Thank you, Nightmare Productions. Thank you. And, you know, this is an example of the little chips you have. It has one 12 pounder or one 4 inch gun and four depth charges. Uh, a Vosta Type 73 Type 1. Again, these will be used for coastal convoys. 45 tons or 50 tons, armed with a couple of 18 inch torpedoes, perhaps, um, or more. Some quick firing six pounder guns. What they often have attacking them, the Schnell boots. The Fairmile D gunboats, yep, yeah, they'd be used as escorts occasionally. Prime escorts, the R class, dance class, Shakespeare class, and tree class. And remember, there are also several hundred trawlers taken up from trade to be used and converted quickly and efficiently. So, in other words, with whatever could be found into escorts. These are the other three classes, which are all based on roughly the same design. Roughly 545 tons, roughly one qu quick firing 12 pounder or one four inch anti aircraft gun, general purpose sort of anti aircraft general purpose gun mounted forward, uh, three 20 millimeter guns and 30 depth charges on racks. And what I would also add remember at the beginning of the war, if a ship has a gun mounted forward, that's considered offensive. So if they had an anti-aircraft or an anti-submarine gun, i.e. a low-aiming low gun, it had to be mounted on the stern. It couldn't be mounted on the front, which meant there was a whole art they couldn't cover. They could carry anti-aircraft guns, but again, they had, a, they had to be a certain calibre because otherwise they could be considered offensive armament, and that would make them weapons. Hill glass. Eight of these were built. Military class, nine of these. These larger trawlers, by the way, were usually used on things like um, the Arctic convoys. Because really, when you're going into Arctic waters, you want to be in 843 tons of ship. Yes, you do. Oh. So, you know, coastal convoys are fun. They really are. Let's answer some questions. I hear some bro for you, Doctor. Thank you. That's very kind of you, Nightmare Productions. And honestly, I didn't tell anyone to say, because to, I expected another thing. I, basically, I was trying to say thank you to the patrons, because, as I said, this month would not have worked out without them. And it annoys me. And the nicest way, I, I treat this as sort of semi-professional slash... An extension of my love for history. I'm not. I wouldn't call it a hobby because I don't treat it as a hobby. I try and be as good and as quality as I would give when I'm giving university lectures or anything like that. But I teach it as an extension of my love of history. I don't do this for the money. Although it's been incredibly critical to actually funding any research I managed to do over the last year. But it's not supposed to be the reliable portion of my income. It's supposed to be the bonus portion that pays for the research, etc. Mm. Ryan Cash, you need to get an XPM to lobby for you, Dr. Clark. Uh, I'm not sure I could afford one. They're too expensive. Uh, Bud Guy, you know, have any US capital ships ever got dry docked in New Kells Australia? I think there have been a couple over, to uh, over time. There is the, oh look, the boat that Drak passed on by. There are many boats that Drak has passed on by. He does consider it on a regular pay, uh, case. Was it considered a class? There are a few classes. Uh, Frank Smith, what's the difference between attack, raid, action, skirmish, battle, and operation? How do you compare to the following? Exercise, Pearl Harbor, Taranto, Black Consulting, da 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 da. Uh, there are so many ways you can classify them, as all can be operations, but. An operation might be a raid and may involve a battle. Um, 
basically it's the uh, the phrase is huge depend on the eye of the beholder definitely the eye of the beholder I ask because it's confusing when aircraft attack ships that all these different terms are used. Some further uh, uh, Crete, Malta, convoys, uh, and all the other attacks on convoys in Europe and Pacific. They are basically, it's in the eye of the beholder. It's whoever's writing what they're talking about and what they're going to classify it as. This arrangement doesn't sound like much, but more than enough to ruin a U-boat state. Pretty much that's the requirement for the trawlers. Some kind of uh, eye class. Know them on a near personal basis. Mm -hmm. uh, about 200 meters separated us, so that's quite close. No, that is very close. Um, I was asking, when going to the Arctic, I prefer to be on shore. <laughs> Team Uluka, uh PQ-17. Yeah, the little trawler did really well there. Right, gosh, huh? wasn't it a tactical consideration like German cruisers rear-mounted armaments to kite away from superior forces? No, it was literally the letter of the law. If they're mounted, if the guns are mounted stern on the merchant ship, then they are considered defensive. If they're mounted on the front, they're considered offensive. What did you say about canals? Well, that's what we're getting into now. Canals are the next part. Um, honestly, I have to say, if you enjoy this enough and do these topics enough, I will return to them in the future because I could go into a lot, lot more detail. As I said, we have done an hour and 30 minutes, broadly speaking, on convoys, on the coastal convoys alone. Canals are, can be just as complicated and could be even more. Aren't you in enough in a position where you have enough materials to write out encyclopedias? Not really, in that it sounds it's gonna sound strange, but when you're writing journal articles, when you're writing all the stuff which you have to keep up with academic currents, you have to keep current with academic publishing. You have to keep current with the books. Um It's expensive. Otherwise, the journals don't submit and accept your books. You have to remember with the academic system, it's the reason why television companies believe they shouldn't have to pay your academics when they go on television. And it's the reason uh, journals don't pay academics for giving them their articles. And it's also one of the reasons why when you're look, talking about publishing a history book, you're getting 7 to 8%. That's the industry standard. The reason is because the whole idea of academia is that you have a well-paying, secured post as an academic at a university. However, increasingly large numbers of us now working on basically zero-hours contracts. This is the fun thing. People talk when they talk about a zero-hours contract. People tend to think of things like. Barist uh, baristas and people who work in shops. Well, yes, also a significant, and I've seen figures as high as 50% of all university teaching is done by people on zero-hours contracts. That wouldn't surprise me. I hope it's less, but that wouldn't surprise me. I'm on zero-hours contracts. I'm on about... Probably... But... Uh... Maybe, uh, but you know, it happens. And I honestly have to say, I get into trouble with some of my colleagues because I go and work for companies like Justin Craig, lovely firm. Again, on a version of a zero hours contract with them, but basically, you get you do work on hot weekends and summer's holidays for the running centers. I never have any trouble being paid by them. I can honestly say, hand on my heart, there is not a single university that's employed me that I haven't had problems at points with pay being forgotten, with pays being skipped for month, sometimes a month late, two months late, or three months late. And then a taxman has real fun, because you've got three months pay come through in one paycheck, and they suddenly think you're in the higher bracket of, ta of tax uh, paying tax, because they do it all on um, um, the pay-as-you-go tax system. Uh, 
and you sort of go, ah, no, and then you have to, you get have to try and get the money back, and it's it just pays you own tax back, pay away you tax them, and it's just it's fun times being a junior academic. It is really really fun. Inca, was increased use made of the canal network during World War Two? Um, uh, we're going to be talking about the canal boat crews being to extent replaced by women. There are a lot of them replaced by women, and you know, I wouldn't say it was increased, but it was certainly well used during World War Two. Probably did go up a little bit, but they were being used quite heavily before World War Two. Um, that is great. Your bonus for this month was getting your car remade and other social bills. Yeah. Uh, Tom Gunning, what was this typical rank of CEO of a trawler? Uh, they'd be a lieutenant. Probably RNVR. Uh, that's Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve. And some of them short-term commissioned, but usually either retired or volunteer commissioned officer. Or, alternatively, someone who was... Quite a lot of the um, trawlers taken up from trade... Their skipper was given a wartime commission and put in charge. I think £5 now and then for what is essentially a history lecture class is a fair trade deal. Thank you. Um, Carl Gasman. Can, catch the Carlsberg's AXY triples out. If what warships is to believe, have a surprisingly small blind field forward. Also, X and Y turrets can rotate... Uh, 360 degrees. Mm, yeah, but honestly, you don't want them firing forward. You're going to rip off your flight. Con uh, your flight. You're going to rip off your stupid structure. Again, that doesn't happen in World of Warships. I love the game, but it, there are things which are the, the for game playing, which are included, which are very sensible, and there are things which would have happened in real life. Uh, Amal 16365. When did the... Uh, fine, thank you for that. When did the Royal Navy start installing air conditioning in their ships? I seem to remember they have experimentations with fans running through the 1920s and 30s. And I think they have the first sort of air conditioning, as we might start calling it, in the 1960s. But I don't think it's really widely fitted or more than experimented with until about the 1990s. I think after the Gulf War one, I start looking at it. Oh, yeah, this topic is great. I'm surprised you let me in this channel. It's a good topic. <laughs> Do you think a midget sub could sneak into a canal and blow it up? Um, honestly, I don't think they'd fit. Oh, sorry, which is why I don't even bother to get a PhD anymore. I can, I, I can understand. As I said, I didn't do the PhD expecting to get a job. Um, it's one of those things. I did my PhD, and then I thought I, I did my PhD for the love of topic, and then I wasn't quite sure where I would end up. I, I, I had an idea that after my PhD, I'd probably end up either having to teach history in schools, which would be fine. Or I might teach in universities, or I might write books and do television. And what actually happened was I came out of my PhD, and I tried to turn my thesis into a book, got that rejected, because there were so many books about aircraft carriers at the time, but it's still there, waiting to be turned into a book. And... From that point on, have done a lot of work. Um, a lot, a lot of work. And various things. I keep looking for the long-term posts and finding a lot of short-term posts, which give me enough money to basically live off and do okay in, but... That, that was mm, pre-having a girlfriend. Having a girlfriend means now... I'm sort of thinking I need to find something which is more, far more regular income, but I'll, I'm working that on that one. If police had a thin blue line, what are teachers, professors, and academics? Ooh. The thin chalk line. 
And I think in the, I seem to remember in the UK, the thin blue line is supposed to be a badge in honor of fallen police officers. I know some people associate it with um, the far right. I Unfortunately, the thing is, in the nicest way, you have a choice with symbols, and this can happen a lot, in that there are symbols which we picked up, uh, which get picked up, and they might have good starting places, and some times another organization picks them up. And the question becomes whether you let, let that organize, whether you concede the ground and let that group take organ ownership of that symbol, or whether you fight back and go, no, this is our symbol. You don't get to take over. You don't get to claim it. You don't get to use it for your ends. And the thing is, honestly, you have to, you, that has to be a sort of cultural decision. And I, sometimes I think groups are too happy to see symbols adopted by other groups, which they don't claim in the first, they don't claim that symbol in the first place. They see a, of the group which is diametrically opposed to them try and adopt that single signal from a third group and they go yeah now that's a bad symbol and that's da 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 and we want to get rid of that symbol and you go well that was adopted by them but it comes from them but you don't care anything about this third group they don't matter to you all you care about is I you don't like them which might be justified they might be absolute SHITs but you need to sort of, you're so happy to ban that symbol when it started out as this, instead of when you should be doing this, go, no, you shouldn't wear that symbol, you're falsely wearing that symbol. Because some of those symbols, when they're adopted by groups, it's the same as when there's the people standing up doing Walter Mitties and wearing medals which they don't deserve, and that sort of thing. You sit there and go, no, don't. Mm hmm. And fact, bizarre difference between lectures on zero hours contracts and versus the steady rising funeraries. Well, uh, that was mm, a point I once made to some of my students was that they were paying for the two hour lecture, I think it was from their fees, uh, that I was giving from their yearly fees, they were paying the equivalent of 60 quid. And so that's what they, that that's what they, everyone in the room cost them. There was about six hundred students in the class, and um, I was paid for that lecture fifteen pounds an hour. So I got thirty pounds. The university took thirty six thousand pounds. Frank Stone, are you aware of any sailing canoes being used effectively in World War II? World Wars? Yeah, well, there are a few. Right then, canals. Far more interesting topic than my, than my bad pay. Galaxy Crow, were Q ships tucked in about uh, amongst sea convoys, sometimes sneak escorts? Yes, they were. Sometimes not so sneak escorts. Let's see, I da, 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 da. um no okay, it's not a lecture. That, that's what's amazing. You give us a seminar in <laughs> class. I skip lectures, never missed a seminar. The seminars are good fun. Um Tom Strivel, I gotta choose my love and passion history or go bankrupt on higher education education. Um funnel to number one. No, uh, sorry, sorry. That uh, what little funds are funneled to number one? Hmm. In car book on Admiral Henderson in the uh, Henderson in the offering. I've got plans for that one. Yes, I've got plans for about the next four books, but it's actually getting the time to sit down and write them. And that's the other problem with doing contract work versus a tenure post, because I'm run, I'm probably working theoretically the same hours as a tenured lecturer, but I run between about f four different posts. And so I need to do the admin for four different roles. I need to put in the pay slips for four different roles. I need to keep up to date with four different email accounts. I need to 
deal with the overheads of four different roles. I need to balance the bosses in four different roles. Honestly, I had the conversation, and I will admit this to you all, that if a patron reached a certain um, level, would I give up one of my jobs? And honestly, the answer was yes, in a heartbeat. As much as I love the students, if patron reached a level I could afford it, giving up one would give me would make my life a huge amount easier. Mm. Dan Trim, if you want to make the K class cruisers a build front mean, you all seem to ask what impact the Blackburn <laughs> might have had on Oh good lord. <sighs> mm-hmm. So what you going? As symbols, I'm from the Midwest. I hate the carping of the OK symbol. Mm. As I say, wait, until you upgrade from I have a girlfriend to I have a you will then have to say a big goodbye to your credit card. I'm allowed a credit card. <laughs> I have one of those. It has a lot of money. It has a lot of money I owe to bank on it. Hmm. Oh, no. The metal thing makes me crazy. My father buried it, so I'll never use again. Hmm. Oh, no. 15 pounds an hour. Yeah. That was it. That was it. They were all paying 60 quid for the two hour lectures. Two hour lectures. And there were 600 of them. And I was on 15 pounds an hour, so I was still getting 30 quid. This is the trouble with actually having lecturers do the lecture. Is that we tend to be able to do some maths in our head and work things out. Anyway, so canals save petrol and rubber. Because we talk about coal, well, coal was very important for a lot of the canal boats. And this is from Sir Osborne Mace, Director of Canals and Division, Ministry of War and Transport. Although few people are aware of this fact, the canals in Britain are now playing an important part in the war transport system. Women and youths as young as 18 have been sent to work in the canals, and we are now following a system which may prove very useful when every hand is needed. On the Grand Union Canal, women are being trained as an interesting experiment. They are all very keen, very keen. You ask how much petrol is being saved by using the canals? It is not possible in the view of the very conditions to make a quantitative general estimate of the petrol saved by using canal transport. Although, as you will appreciate, considerably less petrol per ton mile is used by canal than by road. The possibility of saving long road hauls is being constantly watched, having regard to the urgency of the traffic. We do not forget, rather, that the great deal of rubber is being saved by the use of, can of inland waterways as well. Naturally, the rate of movement is slower than by rail or road, but I will surprise many by saying that I know of one canal where they can frequently get goods through quicker than by rail. So, 622 families worked on the waterways, according to the records of the Ministry of Food. Uh, idle women, or as we'll be getting on it, inland waterway workers, weekly pay was £3 a week, which was equivalent to £113 today, but a lot of money in that time. Good pay. 12 million tonnes of essential goods were transported yearly on the canals. Let's consider that. That's 12 million tonnes a year. Over six years, over six, uh, seven years, that's nine. That's eighty-four million tons. We turked out earlier the total tonnage of ships sunk during World War Two of merchant ships was three million seven hundred sixty-eight thousand five hundred ninety-nine tons in the coastal waters. And 11,899,732 tons are in the North Atlantic. Tra uh, North Atlantic was sunk. So 12 million tons, that's a significant amount of shipping being moved around. And that's a significant amount which doesn't need to go by the coastal route. 
or it doesn't need to go on the roads. There are 28,000 pillboxes built during World War II, of which approximately a third to a half are built in connection with canals, because canals are considered natural, safe, and security rooms. Um, they used concrete to build canal boats when timber supplies were limited. Yes, and some of them are still in existence, apparently. And the Dam Busters used the Trent and Mersey Canal and the River Witton for their training exercises. Now, I thought you'd enjoy this one because here is a cool quote. Some quotes from newspapers. And so it proved that by October 1942, women were indeed needed to work the canals. Speaking in the House of Commons, Mr. P. Noel Baker, Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministry of War Transport, stated that his department had made every effort to increase the use of canals for the carriage of goods in the Birmingham area as well, elsewhere. Uh, the Boeing Mail Met revealed the vital role that women were playing in the use, increased use of canals. The principal, uh, the principal difficulty had been the shortage of labour for canal walls and crews. Women had been trained and several women crews were already at work. Now, this is description. Emma was at the helm handling the diesel-powered narrowboats, each one towing its buddy boat behind. The pairs of boats carried heavy loads, mainly steel, from London to Birmingham, returning laden with coal to be shoveled directly onto canal-side factory wharves. Here's the thing, and this is the reason I put that quote from the, the, from the newspaper in there, is Emma, if you look very closely, there is a, a lady at the back manning the tiller. Well, no. there's a lady on the right who's manning one, who, who manning the tiller, and there's a lady at the back who's actually paying attention, doing more than looking forward, uh, is actually looking at the side. That is Emma. That is the Emma mentioned there. And she had literally one trip. She did one trip with an experienced canals person and was considered trained and then was captaining, helming a barge and its butty boat, which is uh, basically another barge, but with engine and living space removed. Along the canals. She had a crew of two working with her, and that was the training. And they worked through the war. I haven't been able to find a decent book on them. I've had two arrive, and honestly, I've been disappointed in the books I've so far got on canals. I've got another two on order. We'll see how they go. When I look at when looking at various fleet actions, the only times I see carriers disable ships for battleship cruisers to sink are Bismarck, Matapan, Yorktown, Hornet, and Chicago in Adelaide. Was this ultimately successful? Am I missing any? Um, there are a fair number of times they manage to disable ships and don't get the hit. Um, there are times they disable carriers and they sink them, or disable cruisers and they sink them. There's a few cruisers, which are Japanese cruisers, which get. Mm, how do I put this? Ambushed in the Indian Ocean. Oh, hold on. Oh, uh, the accent is you being Winston, Doctor. Any whiskey now, and I'm brute. No. Dangerous Rosie. Oh, God. Political speak. The scent of somberism is so thick you can cut it with a knife. Mm. Uh, Doctor, Doctor see, I just realized the US, if the US supplied Japan with 80% of its oil, what happened to those ships that transported them? Could they have been used for the war effort or at Malta? Um, well, depends where they were. Are so are they having the women leg it when they get to the tunnels? They are having lots of fun with them, actually. Uh, I've had the recent Russian corvette can transfer from the White Sea to the Baltic to the Black Sea and the Caspian. A main part of the Finnish military concept was to hold at least one bank of the White Sea to Baltic bit. Mm. Manage the ship canal can treat a significant number of ships that could be handled through the Mersey. Yeah, that's true. 
I was asking, why pillbox and canals? I understand if you put them on the entrance to cut it off, or just in case. But inland, you'd only need uh, need only air guns because if the Germans land on the beaches, then they have to fight over the canals. You turn the canals into your natural de defensive lines. He went, wow, Friday, almost missed out. I'm surrounded by canals. Central California has terminus for California adequate. 13 giant pumps pump water from a river to Los Angeles. Cool. That's wrong. Women in command? My word, is it worth fighting? <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, as I said, I, I, I just... I was a bit attached to that. I, I kind of thought that picture was cool. I have to say, they, they all looked... Quite good. And actually, uh, uh, no, Emma is one of the people who wrote a book, and I'm hoping to get her book. And I was hoping to have it. It was supposed to arrive there. I managed to track down a copy. And it, hadn't arri it hasn't arrived. And it's going to not get to me. Well, it's going to be delivered actually while I'm away on my research trip. So, mm. as I said, I, if you are all interested enough, I will return to canals and coast. I will return to coastal convoys. And I'll return to canals at some point as well, if you're interested enough in them. Actually, one of the things I'd love to do with the canals, and if it's free and we're able to move around a lot bit easier, is I'd go and do some filming actually next to a canal and wander along it and use the example of that canal. And I do know a fair number of good ones where that could be possible. Or maybe even... Yeah. For that, uh, to me to do that, I'd need to borrow Drakinafell for a few days, but I think I could manage that one, because if we could hire a canal boat and do some filming on one, that could be quite fun. Also, I could put him in charge of a canal boat, and hopefully he wouldn't... No, I couldn't put him in charge of it. He'd start yelling ramming speed, wouldn't he? Yeah, he would. Or he fit his flamethrower to the front. Could, it could be quite fun, though. Here you go. Here's a couple of the, uh, uh, the canal boats coming along. And that's the thing. The canals could go right into cities. But you still had problems with mines. Believe it or not, the Germans would drop bombs and sometimes mines into canals. The reason why mines are sometimes you find mines dropped into houses and some of the unexploded... Oh, we've got an unexploded bomb in our house. What? You have? Yeah. So they're going to... They find it's actually a mine that's been deployed. And it's been dropped by the bombers. And it was aiming for a canal. It was aiming for a river. And instead they've hit someone's house or someone's warehouse or factory or whatever. And that's why they have... Uh, in London, you have naval bomb disposal experts as well as British Army bomb disposal experts and Air Royal Air Force bomb disposal experts. Because sometimes they turn up to him and go, uh, yeah, that's not what I'm trained for. That's a mine. Send for the Navy. Quickly, it's ticking. At which point the Navy would turn up and go, there's a mine on dry land. Woohoo! We don't have to put on scuba gear. Yay! We're not going to get wet. We might just get blown up. Okay. Dan Freeman, women at war on the water in World War One, World War Two. Mm, always fun. Simon Thompson, canals were defence lines in the Anglo-French Belgian plans to hold Belgium in 1940. Um, yeah, the Belgian plans were interesting. I just was to propose filming from Kark. Well, uh, yes, some of the filming might well be done from the Kark, but I might take the Kark along with the canal boat. So we could do some of the really cool places. For example, I'm not quite sure if they'd like you kayaking across their um some of their viaduct, some of their um aqueducts. I'd do it though if they let me. 
And I'm going to, uh, the car, kayak might well be used for some coastal convoy route filming. Or um, I might well take, because I've done round Land's End enough times that I'm not too worried about taking a camera out there. Uh, not even solo. Usually I have a buddy when I go around the, uh, when I go around Land's End, but you know. Uh, Operation Royal Marine was, of course, the British mining Rhine and German canals. Yes, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And Fab, you could dress up the canal boats like iron recruiting vessels. Differential. The advantage of canal over rowing, much more resistance to attacks. Um, yes, but blockages can be tricky. Night Home Productions. Given that one of the Dam Buster bombs was captured intact and reverse engineered to be deployable from F Fuck All 190s, do you reckon they could have deployed against UK canals? Theoretically, but. I honestly haven't ever heard of that before. It must have skipped past me. From Chugger. I understand when the Germans mined railroads in World War II, the RN had to deal with those as well. Um. They did all sorts of things to railways, and the RN did have fun. General do you specifically know when any were any 18th century cannons used in the World Wars? Um. I don't think any 18th century cannons were specifically used in the World Wars. There are mines in the, can the canals. The local fowl population would like a few words with running my Goring. <laughs> Honestly, I would have to say if I were Goring, the swans of the UK would be the animal, would be the people I would be least wanting to piss off. Belgians and Belgians 1914 did not reciprocate. Anticipate that the company of paratroopers on gliders would be enough to dispose of their biggest fort, locking the world, hold the canal defences together. You know, the thing is, just as with Norway, you need to get your reserves actually active in time. Sam Thompson, RAF dropped mines in Holland's waterways while monitoring Enigma radio traffic. Since a German observer would report the coordinates, it worked as a message crib. Hmm, called it gardening. Cool. It's wrong all. They certainly tried to mine modern Rotterdam quite heavily. And fam, problem with canals is if someone shouted duck, no one would. That whom? Canada geese angered by mines dropping guns? I'm uh, Canada geese, you again, don't upset them. They're good at long range flying. They will come and get revenge. Next one, the Germans captured one of the bouncing bombs when a Lancaster carrying it hit, I think, power lines and crashed. They never understood the need to spin it, so I had problems with it coming back up and smacking the aircraft and abandoning the pro abandoned project. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Ooh. Okay, no, guys, did the Germans attack the canals with shopping? Uh, no, not with shopping trolleys, no. <laughs> it was actually, how do I put this? The canals were pretty darn serious. Especially the defensive positions. Um, boom, if I go to this one. These are some of the defensive lines built around Britain in anticipation of invasion. <laughs> and a lot of them, if you overlapped a map of British canals, which I have, um, well, I have a sort of decent one. Mm-hmm. 
Mm, hang on. Because this is a conversion of a PDF to a JPEG. Because I can't put a JPEG up on here. So it's um it's a case of hope and pray. There you go. So if I put this down to here again, and I expand this, you can actually see some, not all of the canals, because I don't think all the canals are actually on here, but you can see some of the principal canal routes, and you can see, if you look carefully, where they, uh, where they start to match up. And there is actually another one I've got as well, which has another set of canals on. Basically, I, the, basically there are like 12 decent maps of canals, but each one's decent in to a different extent. In that uh, they have different uh, canals on them. There you go. There's another one. You can see where the canals are. And the canals are in many ways natural defensive positions because they are usually lowland areas. And they do match up. Ba -ba -da -ba. And get this one. Yada daddy, and move that back to there, and it down to there. All right. Around cash, the Germans attack the canals. Uh, no, answer that one. Same to Thompson. German builders of four uh, builders of four Eban ML were closely consulted during paratrooper operation planning. Ah, uh, yeah. Mr. Answerall, how did the coastal convoys cope with having to supply Europe post D-Day? It was a nightmare, but they got a lot more escorts for post D-Day um, for doing that, that supply route. And to be fair, the Germans started concentrating quite a lot of forces on the stuff crossing the uh, crossing to Europe rather than necessarily crossing. Um, how do I put it? Going around the UK, but. You have to remember, they stuck a huge barrier at each end of the channel. And the basic defensive plan for the stuff going across, the, going across to France was, Thou shalt not pass. Hmm. Nine I know of a footage of F1, uh, FW190 dropping two high tail bombs. Oh, cool. Send it to you on Discord. Um... Uh, In car, Antwerp was captured undamaged and unmined, but Montgomery failed to appreciate the need to clear the Scheldt industry. Hmm. Why is Derby so special? 
Um, Derby gets protections because it's a centre of a northern defensive line. Basically, it's a redoubt. If you got past it, then we're in trouble. Chantons of Japanese had lots of problems supplying Guadalcanal Force. How much did they use small vessels as too small for most American aircraft to bother attacking? Uh, quite a lot, but honestly, there's nothing too small for the Americans to bother attacking because you must remember, ships from a pilot's perspective are like fish from a fisherman's perspective. Whenever they're reporting the fish that they caught, it's that size. Or that size. You know, it's massive whenever you hear a fisherman. Whenever you hear an aircraft, a pilot talking about the ship he sunk, it's colossal. Bristling with machine guns, blasting away at you, everything, and you're diving through fire and everything. You never caught them by surprise, or you caught them by surprise, and they didn't even know until you blasted them sky high. I've read a lot of reports by pilots of sinking who claims they've sunk ships. And I know exactly how many of them actually sunk ships. Frank Spencer, when did the invasion fears end in England during the war? Um, pretty much 1942-ish. They start, uh, really, they stopped worrying once Germany invaded, uh, invaded Russia. It's a case of, if they've got all their troops going that way, it's kind of like Napoleon. They're going off that way. They can't come our way. Adfab, were there any canal gunboats, and would they be RN or Royal Artillery? There were some canal vessels which were fitted with various weapons, and from what I understand it, they were Royal Engineers and Royal Logistics Corps. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, canals were used in World War One all the time as like defensive lines. The canals are often used as defensive lines. They're quite good for a defensive line because they're a solid line that you know exactly where it is. <sighs> And you know pretty much how deep it is, and therefore how difficult it is for someone to cross. Hmm. And then car oil pipelines were laid on the cha under the channel post a D-Day. Uh, pipeline was under the ocean, Pluto. Yeah. That was one of the many things they tried, they did to try and defend these things. But they still had a lot of supplies going back and forwards, and a lot of very interesting ships. See so anyway, why major irrigation channels we use cars on a level of levee banks to pull skiers. Remember, I'm in the, I, I am in a desert, but have best surfing in California. Artificial waves. <laughs> In Desert Storm, the Air Force claimed to have wiped out a Republican Guard tank battalion. Second Armored Cavalry Regiment actually wiped them out. Captured Iraqi commander had listed two tanks to Air Force. Hey, look, uh, I always use the example of Kosovo and Bosnia, where they bombed for ages and they said they destroyed the entire force, and pretty much the Serbs uh, evacuated intact. I don't recall where I heard I don't recall where I heard it, but barges or hulks were put out in the Mersey and loaded up with AA in effort to keep the stuff from falling back on people. Oh yes. There was lots of attempts to use air to use canals to provide fire support to put ships out there with flat guns. Even flat towers were built, which are basically like oil rigs, but in the middle of the ocean to provide defense against ships or aircraft flying up the Thames, etc. Um, Frank Spelter, how did the RAF utilize canals? Mm, there were actually a couple of air bases which were not far from canals and actually used them to supply ammunition. 
and move ammunition to them. Because again, canals were a great way of moving heavy, bulky stuff like ammunition in in ways you. It's honestly a lot safer. Again, you'd be going back to these girls or these ladies as they are now going along, going, hey, hello. Um, actually, I, I found another picture of them. Let me find a picture of them, which I didn't use in the slides because I was worried how it would come out. But let me go track it down. Da, 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 da. And da 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 da, and let's see. Can I find it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? This is the trouble. I should have just put it in a, a, a PowerPoint in one of the slides, but I didn't want to look like I was obsessing over this poor pe uh, over the same people. So, um, you actually have Emma again in this. Um, she is the second from right. So, the lady who's at the back in this photo, in this one, is the second from the right in this one. So, um, yeah. By my guessing, this lady. Mm -hmm. Did anyone use houseboats as command boats on the canals? Not really. They're moving goods mostly. Uh, I think probably knowing him, Montgomery considered it, but um, yeah. Inca, fake targets built to try and decoy night bombs. Yes, they did that. A lot of fake lights put up in various places, so it looked like it was a town or a city. Hmm. <laughs> But no, it was, uh, they worked hard. Ryan Cash, by nature you want to believe your strike was successful and report a kill, and the aura of the explosion affects the pilot and the human just the same. So you believe, what could survive this? Yeah, that happens. But no. As I said, the canals, they're interesting things. There is a lot of stuff moved by them, and frankly, well, I have to say, the thing I found most interesting was that the uh, women had a uniform had IW on it. 
and they were there was a lot of joking about them being idle women and it's standing for that and actually it stood for inland waterways so you can find a lot of people joking about that but they really weren't they really worked very very hard and you would have after world war ii when they were looking at the summer ocean it was a toss-up between uh, from these girls and the um the land army the women's land army over which was more important to the war effort and i think I, I, the women's land army probably won because it employed more women and it was more involved but there's also the factory workers etc but they are they're not as wide a movement each factory is its own group its own it's not a national movement whereas the inland waterways women and the Lands Army are a huge national effort which involve large numbers of people. Hmm. Alright. So questions. Let's see. Um Ooh. Yeah, any questions? What have we got coming up? Um I had fun today. I was, I have to say, preparing some of the stuff for when I'm away for my research week. And, um, yeah, a lot of Dreadnought stuff is being recorded. <laughs> uh, Frank Sartre, were any of them used to, to operate on canals taken over by their advancing forces? I don't think so. I think they usually used local um, con uh, local civilians, etc., from that area, who were the local canal teams who knew their canals. And honestly, the logistics movement in Europe was, once forces were advancing, was sufficiently fast enough that canals weren't really able to keep up that. You could have a daily drop-off at the same point for a factory and for an airfield. You can't for an advancing forces. What would be interesting would be... Well, you see, there has been a women's land army program. I would love to see a TV program about the Canal Girls, really, and all the stuff they get up to, because... We've had television programs involving factories and all those things. Again, the Canal Girls have a very interesting war. A, be quite from a television perspective, it'd be quite easy to produce because you'd have three main characters, as in your crew, and you'd have the people they meet on their way. And if they were doing, let's say, the Grand Union Canal, going all the way from Birmingham to London and back, you could have them experiencing the Blitz, you could have them meeting different people, you could do an entire... It'd be a very interesting way to look at the passage of World War II from the experience, on a, in a televisual way, from the experience of that crew and how they, what they grow up and, you know, all those things. And you could follow the ship, the little sort of canal boat as it goes on, sort of rather like they've done with um, the Call the Midwives program in that you have the midwives, sometimes the midwives change out, and it's still them, it's still called the midwives, because it's still the that particular department, that particular team. And that would be really quite cool, because I think it would illustrate a lot of World War II and the importance of it. It might actually get the logistics home to people. Alistair Crow, I have this odd mental image of a war spike trying to go up a canal just to prove she could, or a tribal class doing the same. There were some of the canals they could probably fit up. Tom Gordon. 
Not really related, Dr. Clark, but there was a good thread on Twitter today with Jamie and Dr. Faulkner about Operation Sea Lion. The British had defeated the Germans as per the war game, aka 80,000 plus casualties. Would the Germans have pushed for peace? Uh, they would probably have something kind of interesting. Frank Spider, MASH or Band of Brothers style? I would say more Band of Brothers style for my um, program. I mean, that's some humour, but also some uh, quite a lot of reality. Run Cash, I thought we weren't calling them Dreadnoughts anymore, Dr. Clark. We, I, I, I call them Dreadnoughts. I'm not calling them Battle... I, I, I call them Battle Cruisers, rather than Battle Cruisers. That's good. Have you talked about the RAF attempt to breach the canals leading to the staging area of Operation Sea Line? It was a bit similar to the Danbos raid, but in Hamptons. They tried many, many things. Actually, one of the interesting things in the defense of the coast and all these things that I found And it's always a fun thing to think, is that um, the Royal Navy really does get involved in trying to prevent an invasion because good old HMS Aurora here, Arafusa class, well, as you all know, one of my favourite cruisers. They are my favourites. It goes and um, bombards Boulogne. Because, well, you might as well know, she bombards them on the uh, 8th of September 1940. <laughs> <laughs> But they had a fairly decent force involved, including, you know, there's some names. They have Rodney, Nelson, Hood, and three anti-aircraft cruisers and a destroyer for flotilla based at Recife. I know exactly which destroyer flotilla that was in August 1940. They also have HMS Revenge at Plymouth. And honestly, if you're going to have a scary ship to send at a attacking inv sea invasion, it's HMS Revenge is coming for you. She will have revenge for you trespassing on our land. In full Royal Navy parity. Um, I love the R-Class battleships. I, 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 I do take the piss out of them on a regular basis, but I do love them as well. And boy, did we put a lump in the lump. One of the things Britain never seems short of, but Germany always seems to be worrying about, is concrete. Concrete and fuel. Britain seems to have large supplies of that throughout World War II. Yes, it's annoying, but it always seems to be on call. They always seem to go, yeah, we have enough. Adfab, were coastal convoys rerouted to continental ports to supply the troops, or was that a different set of ships? A different set of ships mainly, but, you know, it's still quite interesting. Once the ports were cleared up, then they could take bigger ships and they would be sent, but, you know, until they were available, that wasn't the case. 
Um, Van Prim, I think the problem is that I'm not convinced the Germans really would have ever launched Operation Silo. I doubt they f think they would have tried them. Um, they, they, they might have tried it there again. They tried a lot of things. They uh, let's be honest. Wurzburg shouldn't have got, uh, say, uh, shouldn't have cheated. The invasion of Norway should not have succeeded. The Norwegian government is entirely responsible for that invasion succeeding. If they had sent out an alert in a moderately, and I say this honestly, in a moderately practical manner, if they had actually alerted their reserves in a moderately practical manner, the Germans would have got to the, uh, got to the ports to be met by machine guns and riflemen. They would have had every fort manned. Yes, they still might have got personnel on the shore. They still might have, but they would have been dealing with such a much larger force and such a large mobilization. They would have taken horrendous casualties getting there. The delay in mobilization is entirely on the Norwegian government. And honestly, if they were worried about the Germans and upsetting the Germans, they could have just said, we're doing this, but we're mobilizing now because of the British. That's what they could have claimed. Because the British would have taken offence, but probably wouldn't have done much. Let's be honest, the Germans have just invaded Denmark. Why are you waiting around for it? If Norway had hadn't succeeded, then I doubt Crete would have been launched. But if Crete had been launched, uh, Crete had failed, then Britain would have had bombers in. Uh, could have quite easily based bombers well within range of the Romanian oil fields. That would have had been fun for Germany, Mobile Two. That's the crow. Hey, Trimus Furious. A.K. My goodness, I just dropped my tea, and now I'm pretty miffed. Uh. Uh, Frank Spider, do you know what a casualties were, the canal ladies? There don't seem to be any lists. They seem to have done okay, because again, you know, the canals aren't regularly attacked. When they are attacked, they tend to be machine gunned, or, you know, they occasionally run across mines, etc. Uh, but they don't seem to have lost a lot. Probably because, if you think about it, if a canal boat's going forward, if all the crews at the back with the engine steering the ship and sort of ma uh, manning the boat and just, you know, resting up as they can as they're going along the canal. And you've got, a, let's say, a load of coal, etc., or stuff forward. And you set off a mine, or you hit, a, uh, hit, uh, hit an obstacle. Well, the explosion happens at that end, but you're this end. You're going to get probably shaken up, but again, you can, you're can you probably going to live. Um, But... Some didn't, but I don't have exact figures. <sighs> Trent Lenka. The Germans didn't have the fuel for both Sea Lion and Barbarossa. No, they didn't have the fuel line for sea, uh, the fuel for Sea Lion Barbarossa. Uh, for any one, uh, any two of these options, the Sea Lion, Barbarossa, and North Africa. Tom Golding, I think if any of the op Sea Lion, Crete, or Norway had failed, the assessment of it would have been shattered much earlier in the war. Yep. Yeah. Tom Fennel, I fully agree with the Sea Lion Affair. Even Hitler said the only reason I keep these troops there is so they don't realise I'm holding an unloaded pistol at them. Um, you know. Schumach, I divide my thoughts in the eyeglass in two parts. They shouldn't have existed, so it is. They were extremely useful once they were built. Yep.
Dear Scott, if Norway mobilizes because the British, the Germans would have said, we'll come and help defend you. Then the it's nice. It's quite simple. The British, uh, the Norwegians go. We are near. We are mobilizing in defence of our neutrality. We feel that as Germany's invaded Denmark, we might be the British might invade us to protect it. So this is why we are mobilizing. And both you keep well out of our ports. Then Germany's sort of going. Well, we'll come to it. Uh, no. Either way, they find armed troops waiting for them. And the Norwegians were not exactly pro quislings or pro not Nazism. So. I, they don't have wouldn't have had any fun on the on the on the shore. I have no idea on. Uh, Frank Swanner, is it, I have no idea on that one. It's no. Tom Gunning, I don't think, as I've suggested, that a failure in Norway or Sea Line would lead to a military coup and peace. Um, no, I doubt they would have. Uh, I would don't doubt it would have led to a military coup and peace. I think failure in Norway would have probably been, well, that was the most under-resourced campaign we've ever going to attempt. So, yeah, of course we failed. Uh, Paul Trinko, what was the name of that sloop on my super in World War I that the Germans mistook for a cruiser? It was one of the flower-class sloops. Um, I've forgotten it. I, I have done a video about it, but I've forgotten off the top of my head. No, he's ignoring. Because, good forbid you point a gun at the Germans, if it weren't for Blucher literally sailing into the sides of that gun and Norwegian stripping and accidentally firing it. Hmm. I think they fired it on purpose, but you know. Night Hammer Actions. I'd really like to see you or someone lay out an alternate history on Allied victory in Norway and Crete, and have also the impact of the war as a whole. Um, I think I've said before when I was talking about Norway on World War II TV. With Paul. If the Germans had failed in Norway, that would have shortened World War II. That is one of the few events which I really do think would have shortened World War II. Because, and here's my case. If they don't win in Norway, then they're not able to base ships there and attack the northern, uh, attack the Arctic convoys. You can have, especially if you have them allied with the UK after a failed invasion or a failed attack, you can have coastal command flying backwards and forwards between Norway and the UK. They don't get iron ore and fish oil lubricants from Norway. The British can devote, don't have to worry so much about that route, so they can devote more effort to watching the Germans. And you can build a huge mine barrier across the North Sea again to block in submarines because you control both sides of it. This is the point. If you control both sides of the North Sea, the Germans are in trouble. And then you go, right, oh, well, they'll send submarines out through France because they'll still win in France. Well, they might still win in France. They might still win in France, even if they win in Norway. But if they win in France, then they have to get their submarines out of, from, uh, out of the North Sea into to France, which means they either have to go through the Channel, which has a minefields and all sorts of other barriers in it, and lots of nasty things going around, or they have to go through the North Sea minefield and also all the planes going back and forth. And remember, if your gap you have to fly across is the UK to Norway, you require far less aircraft but can keep up a constant rotation of aircraft going over. And especially once you have air searches radar, you then have a huge band where the submarines cannot surface. So they have to do that distance underwater, which means they can't get as far out into the Atlantic, which lessens the effect on the Atlantic convoys. It lessens the effect on... There are so many things if you have control of Norway. And then, of course, if you have, if you're allied with Norway, you have coastal command, maybe find out, you might also base bombers over there. And you suddenly have strategic bomber command flying from Norway down south. And fighters based in Norway with radar support to intercept German attacks. It becomes a nightmare for the Germans very quickly and allied Norway. France might still lose. I still think that would shorten the war. Because, also, it would have made supplying Russia an absolute doddle. Oh, we're in the middle of summer. Well, that's no problem. It would have made the troop convoys from... The troop convoys the Germans did up through up the coast of Norway, through Sweden, across the railway, in, um, into Finland. Can't do that anymore for the invasion of the Soviet Union. There, there's all sorts of options which Norway, if it's not taken by the Germans, shuts down. 
Combine it with winning in Crete, and yeah, you have a much shorter World War Two. Hello, Carl Harmon. Frank Smarter, who built the boats to burn on the canals? There are various canal boat builders. There are different companies. Serp Squad, it read canal boat ca girl casualties. It also helps that you can quite comfortably stand in most canals if your barge sinks. That does help. In car, most modernized R class battleships, Royal Oak was lost. Uh, most modernized R class battleship, Royal Oak was lost early in the war. Sadly, it was, yes. I named my car after Royal Oak, my first one. She was a red Vauxhall Astra. Merit Estate. Lovely one. Elridge. I think L918VHR was her machine to remember. Or was it 934? 918. No, 918. L918VHR was her um, number plate. Good car. Hmm. Tom Golding. Interesting parallel between British coastal convoys in World War II and the British blockade of France in early 1800s. It's really hard to stop coastal trade, even with serious commerce raiding at sea. It is. Carmen. Germany invades Iceland and wins. What happens? The British invade next week and take it back. Um, honestly, Iceland is beyond the range of them being able to support. So if they manage to invade Iceland, they've invaded Iceland by... I don't know, lo loading up Deutschland class cruisers with troops. That's the only way they're getting there. So they maybe got 2,000 troops there. The British will turn up with a lot more than 2,000 troops and a lot bigger ships because Iceland will be taken back. And in nicest way, when you get Deutschland class going, yeah, we've got 11 inch guns. Hello, meet Messrs. Rodney and Nelson. Hello. Please, form an orderly line. We're going to be with you momentarily. Oh, you can't run because you're supporting the troops. Oh, goody. Stay there, then. We're coming to you. Oh, you can't hit us at this range. Don't worry. We can break your armor in half. It would literally be, uh oh, you're tied to a position. How good of you. Run cash. A greater failure in Norway would have meant the German army could walk across the Denmark Straits on a number of sunken, uh, sunken German navy ships. Potentially. I'd be very curious to hear an account of the crew on site command. I think there was a book published in Norwegian after World War II which had it as a detail. I don't know if it's been translated to English. Ryan Cash, Norway is also the northern flank of Europe. You you have all the north, like Game of Thrones, you cannot be outflanked. Yeah. Mm. Um, let's give it up France. How about two series on the armed guard? In the US, they were Navy crews on merchant ships. Uh, yeah, they were in British, they were Britain, they were naval, they were naval service personnel. I think I mentioned them. Oh, yeah, the Dems. Shramak, also, think about all the air support you could give the Soviets directly. Yeah. Hell, you could, excuse the French, you could funnel them troops. <laughs> That was good. Ah, was this the free gigabyte file run by internet transfer and carrier pigeon over 80 miles on the pigeon one? Uh, no. Sadly enough, they just decided to go by telegram and mail up, uh, call up, rather than just using the radios. Thank you, Alex Crow. Intro.
Derm Squad, don't need Nail Rod. Edinburgh and Belfast would probably suffice. Well, yes, possibly, but in the nicest way, if you've got them. And... Do you honestly want to tell Nelson and Rodney that fixed targets of Do of two Deutschland-class cruisers and early enough in World War II, they would have had to be in Deutschland and Graf Bay or... Well, let's see, where is she? Um... Uh, would Shear have been available? Possibly Shear, but Deutschland and Graf Bay were the ones at, the be at sea in the beginning of 1939. So, honestly, I would say it would probably have been Sp it would have been Spay and Deutschland. And if you got Spay and Deutschland... Caught another... Uh, a, it would be a chance to sink a ship named Deutschland. In nicest way, Nelson and Rodney would be having a... Very sisterly version of a ship version of a race, tug of war, call it what you will, um, to see who was the one who would get to sink the Germany. Great Dominion, hello! Joanne, did you discuss the development of the double L sweep and other mentions for combating German magnetic mines? Not really today, because I think I'm going to do that in one where I go in deeper into coastal convoys. I was doing about, broadly speaking, coastal convoys and, broadly speaking, canals, because it's coastal convoys, canals and coal. Um, as I said earlier, I think this is something which we can go into in again in further detail. If people are interested in that, I will happily go into far more detail in the future. Nighthound Productions. What effect does Allied Norway, British occupation Norway have on Finland, their airship, Soviet Union, Germany? Looks rather like being between a rock and a hard place on them. I think if the British are in Norway and not British Norway are allied, you probably have Sweden leaning towards the Allies, especially with Germany having occupied Denmark. And Finland might decide that, frankly, they go neutral rather than supporting the German invasion of the Soviet Union and reigniting that war. Because whilst they've had that war, they've now got allies on both sides. It doesn't look like Germany's going to win it. And they can't really be pressured. Thompson, the ability to memorize obscure numbers like vehicle plate numbers is a key qualification for becoming a skilled military historian. Sad enough, yes. John Shea, if the Germans invaded Iceland with Deutschland class cruisers, the RM would first airstrike the ships with naval land based aircraft. Well, they would have to be naval and sea based aircraft because I don't think there's any land based aircraft which would have the range to engage them in, 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 engage them in Iceland. So, I wonder, I've got a question. Is the Novik class destroy in any way related to the town class? Um, I think that's the Narvik class destroyer, isn't it? Uh, not really, to related to the town class. Let me have a little check not if Novik, uh, if I'm reading that right. Hmm. Ah, Russian destroyer, Novik class. Let's see, German, other oh, Russian ones. Ah, Novik. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo.
Um, I don't think they're related to town-class cruisers, but they're certainly interesting ships. Well designed. Hmm. Unfortunately, she was um, sunk in 1941, Novik. Mm. I was asking Amrish, yeah. Mm. Sometimes I'm curious what come up seen by four Heindel, Heindel's son, uh, Con Tiki, Cure of Norwegians. Mm, I'd have to look that up. Honestly, that's a little bit, you know, I've heard names like that, so I think I have an idea what book I'd have to look in. Because, for if Norway was not also in the same born, was it not invaded again after Narvik? Yes. The British went in. After Narvik, we went, we sent in troops. Um, we just didn't manage to win up in, Nor in Norway because we basically did it half. Uh, 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 let's put it this way: we half-heartedly did it. We didn't do it properly, and we had the uh, we had the command structure from God knows where for some reason. Someone had the bright idea of get, sending the Lord of Cork of Ori and uh, and, Ori and um, the, the his army equivalent, whose name I will not even mention, up there. Sean Mac, a critical part is the British will buy more Bofors than the Germans, so thus the Swedes would probably keep side with the Brits. Mm, potentially. Different. Finland would likely not start the continuation war. That's my theory again, yeah. And said. Some machine gun this annoyed me too much to be dealt with by a mere 16 shell. I want to demonstrate this with 16 inches of the displeasure. It would have been interesting, let's put it this way. <laughs> Darius Rodowski, Finland joined Germany because Norway blocked British supply shipments in Finland during the Winter War. Yeah, that was a bit annoying as well. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone. Um, that's, as said, I hope you've had a nice evening, hope you've enjoyed this. It's almost three hours now, so I'll probably go help everyone with um, what's going on in the house. Let's see. On Sunday, we have Brew Ships 48, Reading History. Basically, some books I enjoy to read, which are good, readable history. Uh, 20th of May, Patron 24, Dan F's, Tuesday to May the 4th, Everything Wrong with Star Wars Fleets. Yes, it was suggested as we were having things on May the 4th, but it wasn't done on May the 4th, because it didn't. Uh, the devote wasn't done until after then, I think. And, uh, or rather, I wasn't going to put it on May the 4th. Uh, I had no desire to be swamped with as many uh, as many Star Wars fans as that would have caused. Um, mainly because they would be so disappointed with the rest of my channel. And they would just complain. Because I would complain if I was them. And then the 3rd of June, Discord suggestion from Adfab. Coastal Command, 1920s and 1930s. There is a reason for that gap. 
There is a lot going to be going up between the 22nd and 29th of May. There are a lot of very interesting, I hope, very fun for you to wa uh, watch videos going up and being taken, uh, being uh, going to be put up. Battle Cruisers Take Two is going up on the 18th of May as Long Patrol, and I hope you enjoy them. But as I said, I am going to disappear for roughly a week. Off on a research trip. All right, let's see. Dan Freeman, read Norway 1940 differently. Put Carthen the Wade in command of land forces, some way equally sneak on the side. Uh, if for some reason you aren't happy to CNC Home Fleet. CNC Home Fleet is fine. Actually, he would have been far better. He, in fact, actually knew what was going on in Norway, which would have been which was an improvement on Cork and Ori. When you look at it, the Germans had the best possible luck in that war and still had hardly a, ch hardly had a chance. Mm -hmm. Take care, Frank Spado. Thank you. Take care, Dan Freeman. Thank you, Paul from Chicago. Thank you, Sean Mack. Uh, thank you for the people who've been doing uh, watching the chat for me and I mean, I mean that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Frank Spazato. Thank you, Dirt Squad. Thank you, Felix B. Thank you, Carvin Hasberg. Thank you, Tis Francis Fultz. Thank you, Thomas Vanderveld. And thank you, Constantrasmus. And thank you, John Shea. Thank you, DGB40. Thank you, Albert Zaski. Telling me in the 60, 40. And where to? Where am I going? Hmm. That's a bit of a secret. Take care, Pettmanter. Take care, this Francis Fault. Take care, Bug Guy8829. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Don't worry, there will be plenty of videos to cover while I'm away. You'll enjoy them. I'm spending this week, and I've spent this week writing and recording them. Thank you, Mike. Mike, take care. Very Sarsky. Uh, thank you, everyone. And remember, the vote will go live on Sunday for June's patrons, uh, patron choices. So make sure if you've got any ideas for what you want covered in June, they are put up today or tomorrow. If they are up, then I can pick from them. If they're not there, I can't pick from them. Thank you, Trent Lenko. Thank you, everyone. Take care. And thank you again to everyone who's done the super chats and the patron who's the patrons. Thank you very much. As said, this month it has been um uh, for something which is done as supposedly an extension of my love of history and a bit of extra money that's very nice to come in to support the research and support the help and all those things. It has proved massively critical. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. I don't know if you're going to Jersey, aren't you? Not this month. July, I am going to Jersey. Not this month. So, in July, I am going to Jersey. So, if you hear a midget sub crash in the Thames Air Street, please send a rescue team consisting of yourself and Drac. Blah, 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 blah. We will try. Take care, that's good. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for making the... And thank you, Stephen White. I think I forgot to say goodnight to you. Thank you. And um, take care. Bye. Uh, wrong one. Yeah. <laughs>